Yes, good afternoon and welcome to the strategic planning meeting for uh, March. Uh, apologies for absence and appointment of substitute members, please. Apologies have been received from Councillors Parker and Humphreys with Councillors Clark and Harris substituting. Thank you. <clears throat> Do any members have any declaration of interest of any of the items posted on this agenda? And if so, please declare it now. Councillor Purser. Yes, I sit on the Northampton Town Planning Committee, so we've seen some of the items, but we're not. Uh, <coughs> I, I've come here with a, a completely open mind on the on this application. As always, sir. Thank you. Right, item three: minutes to confirm the minutes. Firstly, of the committee held on the twenty third of January, and and I refer to. Nikki, to help me on that one, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, it, it was just to add because there, there's been some subsequent concern raised raised regarding the minutes. Um, it's just to add a note that, in addition to to the condition, just a point of clarification to, to say that members request that the submitted routing plan required by that condition that was imposed, condition thirty also takes into account concerns raised regarding the routing of additional vehicles through Caldecott and Tiffield villages and seeks to, seeks to implement measures to limit the extent of contracted vehicles through these villages. So it's to add that note. So given the addition of that note, are we happy to accept those minutes? Please show. All right, thank you. <clears throat> Furthermore, the Planning Committee of Tuesday the 20th of February. Uh, do we agree that they are a true record of what occurred on the day? I will sign those accordingly. Um, item four, which is Chairman's announcements. Under the openness of local government bodies regulation 2014, members of the public or those party to the meeting are permitted to film broadcast or report on the meeting subject to the efficient running of this meeting not being affected. Only those people who have registered in line with the committee's speaking procedure can address the committee. Those speaking are not permitted to ask questions of either members or officers. Members of the public are requested not to call out during the committee's discussion on any item. All speakers will have five minutes in which to make their statement. Participants addressing the planning committee will be advised when they have 60 seconds of their allotted time remaining and will be expected to cease talking immediately on being advised that their time is up. Speakers may be asked to remain seated after they have addressed the committee to answer questions from the planning committee members. There are no planned fire drills, so if the alarm does sound, it is for real. And evacuation instructions will be given by the Democratic officer to my right. And the assembly point is the bottom of the steps of the mount, which is the green area over to my right. Could all electronic devices please be switched off or onto silent mode? For those members using laptops, could I please ask they press F1 on their machines and a blue light would come on indicated the sound is muted. This meeting will be broadcasted on the Council's corporate YouTube channel. Therefore, when speaking, please use your, mic use your microphones and have them close to your mouth, please. And that's that. Thank you. For the benefit of uh, the YouTube uh, translation uh, transmission, I will introduce the top table. It won't be obvious who we've got. On the far right, we have Diana Davis representing legal, uh, sorry, democratic services. On my right, Catherine Hall representing legal service. <clears throat> Myself, Councillor Phil Bignall, chair of the meeting. On my left is Simon Ellis, head of development management. Nikki Scaife, head of major projects. James Patterson, uh, planning officer and Chris Burton, who will be here soon, another planning officer. So without due, we will move on to item five, which is the Market Hall Shopping Centre, Market Square, Northampton. I'll ask James to uh, start the presentation, please. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, so firstly, please note the addendum to the agenda items, which provides written updates in relation to this application. The written updates relate to late representations, which were made after the publication of the committee report. The updates also include 
um, amendments to condition two, uh, correcting an error in the, um, uh, the plans list, uh, and to condition 18, um, which we would now uh, seek to preclude uh, class E, G uses from taking place on the site without the, uh, the need for further planning permission to be sought. Officers also have verbal updates for this application. Uh, firstly, officers wish to draw attention to the late representation which has been made by the Northampton Together Civic Society, which has been circulated to members ahead of the meeting. Um, officers also wish to advise of changes they wish to make to conditions 13 and 15 in order to more closely align with the expected conditions of the associated premise license for the operation of the site. Um, so condition 13 would read that the use hereby permitted shall be open to um, customers only between the hours of 8 a.m. and 2.30 a.m. Um, on any given day. The balconies on the west elevation of the building uh, may not be used by visiting members of the public uh, between the hours of 11 p.m. and 8 a.m. Um, so those changes are to align with the opening hours of the the um, the license, whilst um, in the version of Condition 13 before you, um, the balconies uh, were proposed to be closed from midnight. Um, this has been changed to 11 p.m. following further consultation with environmental health officers. Um, so officers aren't able to advise of an, an exact wording to condition 15 at this time. Um, so condition 15, as presented before you, precludes any music being played on the balconies. Um, essentially, officers would seek to use the delegated powers um, shouldn't the committee be minded to approve the application um, to make amendments to conditions um, and what we would seek the condition to do is uh, ensure no live music is played on the balcony um, and allow some pre-recorded um, music to be played on the balcony but uh, below a, a certain level so as to not give rise to um, amenity issues um, but we need further further discussions with our internal specialists before um, arriving at final wording to that. <clears throat> so those are the updates. Um, so this application relates to Market Walk, uh, a shopping centre within um, the town centre of Northampton. The site occupies a prominent position in the town centre, being sited on the eastern side of Market Square, which is a key public space within Northampton and the focal point of retail and leisure in the town centre. One of two entrances to the shopping centre is via Market Square. Uh, this side of the building also includes the principal facade of the building, which forms a substantial part of the eastern edge to Market Square. The facade currently uh, includes several commercial units at ground floor level, which have their own shop fronts, which open out into Market Square. Uh, the other access is provided uh, via Abington Street. Um, this elevation of the building is less significant with the elevation comprising a modest section of the frontage on the north side of Abington Street. Uh, the shopping centre is laid out so one can um, walk through one access and travel through the shopping centre and exit via the other entrance. Although the building has an unusual split level arrangement, which means one must either ascend or descend the level to do this. Uh, Market Walk has been closed to visiting members of the public and has been vacant since January 2021. Uh, so this is a heritage plan showing designated heritage assets around the site. Uh, as shown on this plan, the portion of the site for, um, fronting Market Square falls within the All Saints Conservation Area, while also falling within the setting of numerous listed buildings, including the Grade 2 star listed Beethoven House, which is contiguous with the site. Uh, so this is this is Beethoven House here. Uh, so this is an aerial plan which helps illustrate the context of the land subject to this application. Obviously the outline um, the site is outlined in red. Uh, so we're going to go through site photos now. It should be uh, self-explanatory once I move this out of the way. There we go. Um, so it should be self-explanatory and obviously members have the benefit of a site visit as well. Uh, so this is the Abington Street entrance, uh, moving to the Market uh, Square entrance. Uh, and this is from the opposite side of the Market Square, which is obviously under undergoing redevelopment. 
Uh, this shows some of the historic forms uh, referred to in the report. So this is Peacock Hotel, uh, which was a coaching inn demolished in uh, 1960. Uh, this was the replacement shopping arcade. Uh, and then this replaced that in the uh, the 90s, which is currently in situ. Uh, and then these are just photos, just giving giving a flavor of the internals. Obviously, you can see it's um, boarded up and vacant at the moment. So this is the main uh, thoroughfare through Market Walk central foyer again showing those split levels this is the roof um, showing some of the surrounding roofscape uh, and we'll quickly go through the plans obviously the plans have uh, been available on the public access so we'll go through them quite speedily uh, again they should all be very self-explanatory Uh, so is all the existing plans, the existing elevations. So it's obviously the principal elevation on Market Square, uh, and then the elevation uh, in the wider street scene context. Uh, and obviously, this is a section showing the unusual split level arrangement. A proposed block plan. Obviously, you can see the um, only changes are at the um, the facades themselves. Um, so obviously, there's limited detail on the internal arrangement, but um, Obviously, this just shows the general arrangement as well as the um, uh, layout of the um, outdoor seating area at ground floor level uh, and then the balconies above. So obviously, this is the balconies here, which face out onto Market Square. Uh, and then this is the uh, proposed elevation on the principal facade facing Market Square. Uh, side elevations of the balconies and uh, the elevations set in the uh, wider street scene context. Uh, the Abington Square frontage, again, set within the um, context of the building line. Uh, again, this is a, sort of broadly how, how the internals would be arranged through a section. And we'll just go through some visuals. That's how it's expected to um to look at in the evenings. <clears throat> uh, so this is um an overlay plan showing the proposed extension in the its wider context um within the on ongoing um development in Market Square. Um, so obviously you've got the extension here, and then um. This is the, the wider redevelopment of the square. <clears throat> uh, planning officers consider that the proposed development meets the overall aims of national and local policy um, and would obviously do much to reinvigorate the town centre and support its regeneration and meet those objectives. Likewise, um, officers are uh, satisfied that any associated technical matters can be dealt with by appropriately worded conditions. Uh, therefore, officers recommend the application is approved. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, James. Um, we now invite questions from members for the officer. Councillor Gonzalez Savage. Thank you, Vice Chair. Um, a question, if I may, um, to James, in terms of access to the building for or access from the waste areas, the buildings. I noted in the report there is a issue there about the fact that waste will will be managed on site, but, but exactly how will they get waste out and which bins will they use and where will those bins be stored? Thank you. Um. So obviously much of the waste management arrangements would remain the same as before um, and waste would principally be managed via the roof access as existing. Um, but we have covered that as part of condition nine, where we'd require full service and delivery plan to be submitted and approved prior to first occupation. And obviously that will deal with um, with waste as part of that, um, including um, obviously how much waste is expected to be generated and you know how how the uh, 
bins, et cetera, will be laid out. So, um, so it'll be broadly sim similar to the existing, but we're confident that we can uh, get those final details via condition and deal with it that way. I just double check, Mr. Yeah, Chairman. Carry on, carry Thank on. you. Um, and so, in terms of the waste currently for the buildings, clearly it has or it had uh, some. It had a small coffee shop operating within, and the rest of them was, were clothes areas and, uh, and and retail. And now it's going to obviously all food, and that's going to take a huge volume uh, of food waste, uh, and therefore create uh, additional waste externally because quite clearly they'll also be selling. Um, food, which is takeaway, if this goes through, uh, from a perspective of that. So, I'd like to encourage this development, but I want to just be sure that we're not creating a massive waste issue. Um, and James, just confirm it's going onto the roof. Did you say? Yeah. So at the moment, it, it's quite a. If we just get back to the. Um, or have, you, have you got the aerial? Oh, yeah. yeah. It's quite a complex arrangement of, of buildings around there, but there is access from um, the road adjacent to, to Greyfriars, and you effectively go through the, the, the car park. So there's access for refuse vehicles up onto the, effectively the top of the, the roof. So there would be access for refuse vehicles there and a degree of refuse storage um, um, the, the applicants are indicating would also be at ground full level. So some of it may come out onto Market Square during collection days only, but that detail of that is is to be agreed by the condition to ensure that we don't end up with a scenario where you've got waste bins obviously detracting from the Market Square itself. It's because we currently have a, a real bin issue in some streets, as we know, um, and quite clearly commercial waste is much larger and hugely more bulky. So I can't imagine it'd be a very discreet, but if it came out of the market square, can we not uh, condition it that it is totally on the roof then and none of it comes onto market square or Avenue Street? I mean, that that's what we could liaise with our, our colleagues in environmental health and the waste team to to make sure we get a agreed, totally prohibit that as well. Councillor Stone, please. Thank you. I'm worried about the waste issues as well, actually. And I was going to ask about access issues. Is this development still sharing access with the Grosvenor Centre? Um, yeah, so we'll continue to use that um, existing arrangement through the, the Grosvenor Centre um, car park. And I, I think also just on the, the waste issues, it's worth noting that um, obviously with the introduction of Class E, um, planning permission isn't actually needed to change the existing units into um, eateries anyway, so um, the proposal wouldn't be changing much in, in that regard. Are there going to be any issues around the shared access? Yeah, so I suppose that might be better directed to the applicant when they um, come to speak, but we're not aware of any issues and it would be um, a private matter for the applicant to ensure that access can be continued. Councillor Herring, please. Um, I'm just looking at um, condition 13 and you went a bit too fast for me when you were going through the timings and um i thought i heard you say 2:30 uh but that doesn't seem to be down here it says 12:30 so I, can you can you just reiterate so i can alter it on my conditions uh yes of course apologies for for reading too fast um, <laughs> it's just i couldn't take it take in the numbers fast enough um so the condition originally dealt with the opening hours and pre-recorded music um, so the music issue is, will be pushed entirely to condition 15 um, as per my verbal update. So condition 13, um, so these these opening hours were taken from um, the noise assessment that was submitted. Um, but since then, the applicant has submitted a um, licensing application um, 
and those opening hours, which um, our understanding is were agreed in consultation with our own internal um, environmental health specialists. Um, so the license would allow them to open from eight until two thirty in the morning. So, so all we're seeking to do is align align with that, um, and obviously, um, <laughs> that's been undertaken. Um, like I said, uh, with specialist advice in mind as well. So is that all all the whole week, or just at the weekends? Um, yeah. So yeah, the license doesn't specify. Um, so likewise, um, the condition we propose would be any any day it can open between those hours so this is uh, i mean, i've come across this before over a, a different issue as i'm sure our chair will remember as to what takes precedent whether it's the licensing or planning because planning can still condition those times even if licensing has given a wider um birth so to speak is that not true uh, yes, that's right. Um, if members were minded, obviously condition conditions can be amended by members if if they feel that's appropriate. Um, we we were simply seeking to align with the license and making sure the council's various regulatory arms were married up in in that regard. Um, so that's that's why we've proposed to change it. But obviously, um, the the applicant would have to comply with both. Um, any licensing arrangements and any planning conditions. We can certainly uh, discuss that under discussions. Councillor Harris is next. Please. Thank you, Chair. Um, I, I have some broader comments, but I'll save that for the wider discussion. The, the, my specific question, uh, having looked at the conditions, again, I couldn't see anything specific there. It talks about hoardings uh, and signage and displays and so on when development work is taking place. But obviously, at the moment, there's uh, there's an 11 to 12 million pound piece of work going on in Market Square currently, which in theory should be nearing completion. And I believe works has already started in Abington Street on further development works. So should there be any protections or conditions in regards to development and accessibility? It's not clear to me where access comes from in order to redevelop this site. Clearly, there's going to need to be access. And it concerns me that there could be the potential risk for damage in either of, of those areas where a consider considerable amount of money has been invested and spent already. Um, so it's just a clarification question whether there should be something related to access for redevelopment. So there's there's condition three, which, which requires construction management plan. Um, subject to that, there the the building obviously does come out onto the market square and it's council owned land so there would be ongoing discussions kind of outside of the planning remit in, in terms of access and how that's controlled and, and any damage control to the market square and access to the market so i guess it's a question of whether we can be more specific on that condition three about those issues uh, can i come back at the end chair and i'll have a think yes you can <laughs> all right we'll get back to you yeah I saw Councillor Russell next. Thank you. Um, I'm a bit concerned about the ageing infrastructure in Grosvenor Centre. So if, if there's going to be access through the Grosvenor Centre, will it be the time specified in the conditions? And if so, is there going to be any upgrading or any security provisions in the Grosvenor Centre car park and the lifts, because the lifts are absolutely dreadful. Um, so the application doesn't include any um, any repairs or improvements to the Grosvenor Centre itself. Councillor Pritchard, please. Thank you, thank you, Chair. Um, with regards to, uh, and probably this probably be covered in the debate, but uh, presumably if the centre is going to be open for licensing until 2.30 in the morning, does that mean to say that all the other shops can actually be open until 2.30, things like the food outlets, cafes and so on? It, it would really depend on what existing planning conditions and licensing arrangements are in in place um and, and they would have to they would have to vary whatever existing arrangement they have um 
to to be able to stay open the same length of time so i think at that point they'd they'd have to go through the process and be considered on a case by case basis councillor gonzalez is average please thank you councillor um thank you mr chairman um just to get some clarification from james so page 53 condition 13 we've had eight till 2 30 a.m mentioned that i don't know how that overlays with what we currently got and originally you started off with a presentation very kind of james saying 11 p.m i'm not sure where any of those times are could we go from the top to the bottom for complete clarity what those times should read so sunday to thursday i've got currently 10 a.m until midnight is it going to 11 p.m or is it going to 2 30 in the morning um i think what i'll what i can do is i'll read out the um because with condition 13 we have a, a draft a draft in mind um so essentially we're removing any so we're removing the the um reference to live and pre-recorded music so that bit's been deleted and will be de dealt with solely sorry in... but before that but if we can just start from the top of that section if you wouldn't mind just for complete clarity for yeah the yeah committee. so i'll, I'll read it out but i'm just explaining what, Lovely, what's thanks. changed first okay. and then and start from the top and then work down that's much easier okay well i'll, I'll read it out first then uh so essentially what you have just um it might be simpler just to put a line through that and then i'll just re i'll read out the amended condition again uh so the use hereby permitted shall be open to customers only between 8 a.m and 2 30 a.m on any given day um so that's that's the only bit that deals with the broad opening hours um and then the balconies on the west elevation of the building may not be used by visiting members of the public between the hours of 11 p.m. and 8 a.m. So that's um, so the reference to the balconies in the existing condition was um, from midnight until 8 a.m. Um, but we've since had additional environmental health advice, which says 11. It should have been 11 p.m. Um, so that's so that's the condition we're proposing. Um, to hope, I hope okay, that so clarifies. That, that means that the permission to open the, the premises is going from is two hours earlier, so going from 10 to 8 now to open, so yeah. 8 o'clock in the morning. So, so every day, 8 till 2 30, the whole building, right? Apart from the balconies, which has a separate restriction, right? Because you're, the original obviously had lots of different breakdowns, yeah, some days so, so, so what, four o'clock and yeah, all sorts of things. Sorry, right. yeah, I didn't mean to interrupt. Okay, yeah, so, so we, we've um, clarified and streamlined all that. Yeah, yes. so we basically streamlined all that. So that that's that was all lifted from the um the noise report, and since then this license has come to light, which we've married up with, which is why it's been somewhat simplified. Okay, um, thank you very much. Okay. Yeah, sorry, Councillor Herring. Um, since this change, um, has has that um quite extreme change being consulted with all the other parties therefore you know any of the um, comments uh, possible objections or not um been has that timing been consulted with you know the police the um, local council the local community or has this change come in since Um, so, so we haven't taken the application back out to reconsult because of that change. Um, because obviously, since this condition, we don't consult, um, do a full consultation on that basis anyway. Um, but with these opening hours, I think key stakeholders would have been consulted, and um, because of the licensing. So, obviously, I know the the police and the um, environmental health team have all fed into the licensing process. So, um. So it has been consulted on in, in that sense, and they've they've had input into it that way. Any more questions before we invite the speaker forward? Sorry, Chair, can I just yes, add? Oh, I didn't know you got the answer, sorry. Well, no, it, it was just to add that the licensing in itself is is, is subject to a consultation exercise. Um, and with respect to licensing colleagues yesterday, there'd been no objections re received. Have you got an answer for Councillor Harris yet? Or are you still working on that one? I was just going to add in, in terms of the construction management plan that we'll add in in consultation with the, the, the relevant um, sections of, of, of the council. So that will include kind of our regeneration colleagues as well. 
Happy with that. Councillor Stone again. Could I just ask you if there's going to be a restriction on the volume of the noise being permitted until 2.30? I'm asking because there's a huge number of residential flats all around the stack, as it's being proposed, including Beethoven House, but there's lots of flats adjacent on Abington Street. If they're going to be impacted until 2.30, that seems to me to be really problematic. A lot of the people who live along around there are shift workers and health workers. You know, they might need their sleep. Um, so that's that's dealt with in condition 14, where um, we would require the site to operate in accordance with the recommendations of the submitted acoustic assessment report. Um, and again, our environmental health officers have been very very thorough going going through it and um working working with the applicant in that regard so it does include um it does include measures to um ensure that there's there's not unacceptable noise or noise spillage um on on neighboring uses obviously appreciating that there are dwellings um near to the site um so obviously we've carefully considered the impact on them. Um, I'm just trying to find, so condition four also deals with um, noise attenuation measures um, between the site and Beethoven House. Um, so obviously Beethoven House has the extant permission for um, a residential use. So um, we feel that through conditions four and 14, we could um, we could mitigate any noise to an acceptable level that's not going to unacceptably um, disturb uh, nearby residences. Thank you, yeah, Councillor Pritchard. Thank you, Chair. <clears throat> Thank you, Chair. Um, is there any restrictions whatsoever on the type of uh, outlets that will actually be uh, in this particular facility because obviously you know there could be a situation where you have 25 30 um you know cafes and also bars there so uh, you know is there any restriction with regards to that um so the the restrictions would uh, simply be to the use classes specified in the um in in the application so um obviously we've um suggested a condition limiting uh limiting the use of the site to these uses um including prohibiting use class e g which is light industrial and offices um but between those uses within class e um there's flexibility internally um to the development to switch between these uses but they the applicant actually also benefits from that anyway because the lawful use of the site is class e um obviously the, the the sort of part of the need for the application has arisen because of the sui generis um uses being introduced which is the drinking establishments and uh live entertainment but ultimately the applicant would have flexibility between these uses and um obviously could respond to conditions by um um by yeah, mixing mixing these uses. Um, obviously, that means in theory they could have the entire site covered in cafes, but obviously that's I don't think that's likely to happen. As obviously the um, the applicant would be keen to obviously maintain these mix of uses, which all complement one another. Also, you you actually just brought up a particular question: Will there be any public toilets in the site? Um, we don't have information about the precise arrangements relating to to toilets, so I think um, the, the applicant doesn't actually require planning permission for that. So that might be a question better directed to the applicant, uh, to be honest. Okay. Yeah, it, it, it was just coming on in terms of the uses. Obviously, the the kind of whole ethos of stack is for a huge variety of, of mixed uses, including kind of this leisure entertainment, live music venue, complemented by drinking establishments and, and cafes. So so that's the intention. So as James said, within Class E, there's nothing to um, restrict, you, you know, the extent or number 
of particular cafes, but that's not the intention of, of, of this applicant. It's, it's very much a mix of uses and um, leisure uses, including kind of indoor bowling and, and variety of family friendly uses on, on the ground floor. So, so that's what their application is about. Councillor Gonzalez to Savage. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, a question in reference to the uh, conditions on item 13. Uh, there are only two days of the year when Northampton, Market Square and Town fall completely quiet. And those are Armistice Day and Remembrance Sunday, uh, where services are held externally uh, in the Memorial Gardens at the back of uh, All Saints Church. I would very much want, because the original planning permission here, or the, the condition was that it would be from four o'clock onwards on Sundays, uh, I'd very much want to see that condition 13 reflected that. And whilst we have a super um, live venue, I'm sure it, it, it uh, has all the encouraging factors of being a very modern and a very encouraging place to, to be at. I would very much hope that we could introduce something there in the planning condition that would respect um, those two particular days. And the services, generally speaking, would finish by midday. So on those two days that they would be from midday onwards, live music could be played because I'm absolutely sure, because I've been at many of those services, that you can hear a pin drop in the Memorial Garden. So it would be uh, out of taste if we had live music booming away in the background so close. Thank you. Thank you. James? Um, yes, yeah, so I guess just to quickly respond to that, obviously members can amend Condition 13 as they feel appropriate. Um, I think I obviously, you know, sympathise with the um, the point being made, but I wonder if it would be justified in, in, in planning terms in that the restriction doesn't apply to anyone else. I think it's I, I suppose that's I suppose it's for members to members to consider, um, but as part of that consideration to have to consider the planning merits as well. We don't currently have any establishment of that type on, on the market square. Quite clear we'd welcome all new establishments uh, and a very successful town. But the nearest one is the Shipman's pub, which is obviously an indoor facility and doesn't have any loud music or any sort of tools. So this with live music in itself would be quite a an attractive environment, I'm sure. We would just want two days. I'm sure committee members would would join me in the respect of those two days a year, where live music would be from midday onwards on those two days. It, it's just to say that the the live music is to be contained within the building, and and the the, the planning conditions. Well, you can actually hear. That. I mean, Nikki, you're, 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 that's an interesting perspective. Um, but you can actually hear, having been at those services, anything. During the time that the, the town literally falls completely dead silent um, around that time, um, around 11 o'clock, particularly uh, Armistice Day and uh, on Remnant Sunday when the service comes out. So anything at all that detracts from the silence is really important. And I think on those two days, I would very much value seeing from midday onwards. I'm sure it's not a, an unreasonable request, but I think it would therefore uh, help all, all people who are remembering uh, such important dates. Do so peacefully. Thank you. Thank you. So I know you're not. Yeah, I was just looking at um, counts, uh, condition, recommended condition 14 that deals with, so no, 15 deals with live music. That only refers to external, doesn't it? No sound amplified equipment shall be installed or operated on the balconies or other areas external to the building. But what you're suggesting is a ban on amplified music throughout the, within the premises, throughout the premises on Armistice Day and Remembrance Sunday, uh, only after 12, 12 p.m. I think that would require a separate condition because it's not really related to condition 15, but it probably is covered by the licensing process, but has that already been resolved, the licensing? I prefer we did it on planning rather than the expectation that licensing would pick that up. Yeah. I think it is important in reference to our earlier conversation. I think James, adv James' advice on the, the strict planning justification for that might be tricky, but in terms of goodwill, I think you added that condition in. I, I can't see why it wouldn't be adhered to. Take advice from my right. Sure, thank you. 
Thank you, Chair. Um, I think I appreciate the, the 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 rationale behind the request, and I understand that obviously this is a significant building um, in an area that's going to be at, on those particular days sensitive. My only concern is just how we then couch it in planning terms to make it meet the statutory test, because it's not something we normally would ask of other businesses, whether they're shopping centres or whether they're um, um, other other pubs, but you know, public houses in the area, whether or not they have the live music. So I think it's just whether or not we could couch it sufficiently for it to be a robust condition and meet the statutory test. That's where I would have a concern on it, but I do understand the rationale behind the request. I'm just not sure how we can deliver it on a planning side of matters, I'm afraid. Sure. There's nothing comparable. And obviously the memorial gardens can be seen directly, because I was there this morning, directly from uh, that site. So therefore, it is the only transfer of music, if you like, that could be heard. And it would be something, I think, um, that with the sensitivities around that, that would be welcomed to try and find a way with the appropriate wording to do that. Thank you. OK, thank you. Councillor Stone, please. Thank you. Um, I think this is potentially a really exciting development, to be honest with you, but I'm still worried about that mix of this kind of facility with residential properties. And I'm wondering if there's any issues around light pollution. And I'm also worried about how how is the movement of people going to be managed, particularly late at night? If we have lots of people coming and going and there is residential dwellings all around that could be quite a, a nuisance really couldn't it james um <clears throat> oh thank you chair um so with regard to external illumination and light spillage um that should be dealt with in condition 17 um in which we also reference the, um, the the relevant guidance notes, and obviously that condition would be dealt with um, in in consultation with our environmental health officers. So I think we we feel quite comfortable that that condition could mitigate that issue. Uh, in terms of the movement of people, we don't we aren't recommending any conditions in in relation to that. But um, our understanding is again that would be more of a licensing issue. Um, and obviously the, the applicant would have security guards and, and similar. So our view would be that those sort of operational matters would be better dealt with under the licensing. So we haven't recommended any conditions specifically pertaining to that issue. Thank you, James. I think we'll now move on to uh, speaker time. Okay, yep, yeah, I'd invite Amelia Robson, agent, to come forward, and I believe she's got a technical expert she may want to bring with her. Technical expert as well? So if you need to refer to them then. But uh, so you've got five minutes, which I'll kind of, when you make yourself comfortable, make sure the mic's close to your mouth. And when you start, I'll start time in the five minutes to let you know when there's a minute to go. Thank you. You can commence. Good afternoon, members. My name is Amelia Robson of Savills, and I'd like to thank you for the opportunity to speak on behalf of Stack, who is the applicant and proposed operator that is seeking planning permission to bring Market Walk back into positive town centre use. The application is recommended for approval following a comprehensive and robust assessment by your professional officers and statutory technical consultees, including your environmental health officers. Both ourselves and your officers have worked together in a positive and constructive manner to ensure the right scheme can be delivered to support the regeneration of Northampton Town Centre. Currently, the existing market walk does not positively contribute to supporting the vital vitality of the town centre or the wider visual immunity of the area. The applicant intends to provide a multifunctional space which has stood vacant for over three years and bring back into life this asset by drawing residents, residents and visitors into the town centre. The proposal will repurpose in full the entirety of Market Walk. It is the first of its kind in England, whereby a shopping centre will be repurposed in full for a mix of food, beverage and entertainment uses. The space is proposed to be used by Stack for a mix of uses, including retail, leisure, food and beverage, 
community and entertainment, including live music performances. The flexible nature of the development is a strong positive of the proposal. The introduction of a new leisure and social community hub concept in Northampton will substantially contribute to the town centre's overall vitality and viability. The proposal will support and enhance both Northampton's day and nighttime economy. Stack will be a key attractor to the town centre that will also have significant spin-off benefits for surrounding uses and will support wider regeneration plans within the town centre and its edges. The operation will tie in well with the new activity being generated through the positive public sector refreshing of both Market Square and Abington Street that surround the site. The proposal is therefore a positive private sector intervention that complements the council's own investment in the town centre. The approach is a truly positive public and private partnership which supports the town and draws residents into the centre and supports the promotion of the council's further strategic ambition for regenerating it. A key part of Stack's business is that it supports local food and beverage businesses to operate from its premises, contributing to the distinctly local operations that will take place from the site. There have been numerous examples at other Stack premises where local independent traders grew from Stack to expand into further businesses in their own right. The design of the scheme significantly improves on the existing facade onto Market Square, whilst ensuring that due consideration is given to any heritage assets within the vicinity. The proposed design creates an active frontage on Market Square to ensure that there is better permeability and connection with the wider town centre and creating the outdoor use of the site, which will further enhance activity and draw people into the Market Square area. The proposal will therefore ensure the vitality and viability of the town centre by creating a new visitor destination that will increase the centre's attraction and support the ongoing improvement of the appearance of Market Square. The proposal will also create over 250 new jobs, contributing substantially to the town centre's economy. We are really excited to be bringing the stack offering to Northampton, which we consider will be an exciting addition to the town that revitalizes a redundant site. The applicant has addressed all technical matters and provided a policy compliance scheme, which will bring significant benefits to the local community and wider area. We very much hope that members can support the recommendation of your officers and vote to approve this application. Thank you again for your time. Thank you very much indeed. If you'd like to remain seated and you can fill some questions, starting with Councillor Heron, please. Feel free if you need to call upon your expert to help, then please do. Um, much um, uh, has been made of these um, container doors that are being used. Can you tell me a bit more about them? On the architect's impression, it look, they look like uh, bifold doors, to be honest. Um, but are we talking about painted doors or do you think it's very hip to have um, like distressed ones with graffiti on them? And so so those are in the open position. And in fact, actually, if you look on the left hand side, they look like bifold doors that have been opened up. Um, am I understanding that these um, container doors are going to be form the background actually of those um, balconies? And if so, what colour will they be? Uh, as I say, are they going to be distressed or graffitied or, yeah, just can you explain more about it? Thank you. Yeah, of course, no problem. So the um, some of the detailed design is still yet to be approved as part of the conditions to basically understand exactly, you know, the, the level of detail that has to go into the construction is something that the architects need to work on post planning permission. So that's something that we kind of work through. But the... Um, the detail of the doors, it'll be anthracite grey. And I think Neil can probably provide further detail on the construction exactly of those doors. Yeah, is it okay for Neil to come and sit here? Thank you. Good afternoon. Um, yeah, the um, the doors themselves are uh, they, they are they are made, um, made to look like a container, but they're not they're not made of metal, so there will be a timber type um, structure. They look just like in a, uh, a container door. Um, 
but wooden that would open. Um, color wise, uh, anthracite gray and turquoise are our two colors with the main focus on anthracite gray with a little touch of turquoise. So where you see the sign on the on the main entrance, that would be more of a turquoise color. Thank you. That 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 really helps because it sounds it by co calling them container doors. I had a vision of the metal, and I thought a lot of comments had been made about that was more appropriate for a warehousing industrial type look, and and obviously if you wanted them distressed and graffitied, we might not think that was appropriate in the Georgian square yeah, of Northampton. There certainly won't be any graffiti. I can assure you of that. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, my question earlier, will there actually be public toilets um, available on this particular site? Um, not sure there'll be public toilets as in, you know, um, uh, advertisers, public toilets. However, in, 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 in our Seaburn stack, for instance, which is on the, on the seafront, we allow people to walk the dogs who don't come in and use stack for anything other than using the toilets to use the toilets. So we're, we're very friendly for people who wanted to just walk through. It'd be very transient, I would think, from Market Square through to Abingdon Street. People will walk through. If they want to use the toilets, we would not stop them from doing that. Okay. And secondly, uh, where have you actually done this development before? First scheme was in Newcastle, on time, which was the bottom of Northumberland Street uh, on Pilgrim Street, which was... Uh, um, I think that was a that was more well it was a container scheme so that was a container scheme with a with a tented roof. Uh, the second scheme is in Seaburn, Sunderland, which is right on the coast, which once again is a um, a container scheme with a uh, with a tented roof. Um, we have a site in Lincoln that opens on uh, week commencing the thirteenth of May, so that's a repurposed um, building. Part of it's Grade Two listed um, with a with a roof space as well. So um, repurposing and container schemes as in traditional container schemes they're the two types of uh, development that we do and presumably all of these other events um are, have in fact live music and stages and so on yeah the big the big the big focus is on live entertainment um well that's not just the nighttime economy that's the daytime economy as well so that would be um, kids performances uh, local schools coming down for carol services um, I think in Lincoln we open with the rock choir, um, that type of thing. So mm. it's, it's 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 from from sort of lunchtime through till till late at night. But um, big focus on on the local community coming in. We do performances with so we might have an open mic night, for instance, once a month with the local autistic society. We might have a, a normal open mic night. Um, so you know all, all sorts of um, uh, we work very closely with the local community to bring to bring them into the in, into the development. Thank you, that's quite encouraging. Thank you. Councillor Harris, please. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, could you, could you not directly relevant to the planning application per se, but could you give us a little bit of a, an overview of the operating model? So, for instance, just to clarify, you develop and you sublet to different operators, or that would be useful to know. The, the, the reason for my question is uh, we all know Northampton has had and is still undergoing a degree of challenge historically. Um, and I, I, I guess it's linked to a question around market research and what your view is in terms of how easy or difficult it might be to find people to operate and therefore to what extent is it speculative or do you have people already knocking your doors down to come and get involved? I think, I think the, the first thing is if you don't have something for people to come out to, they won't come out, first of all. So you've got to create something that makes them want to come and visit, first of all. The model is is built around um, Great Street Food, so Great Street Food operators um, from the Northampton area. Um, we operate all of the bars, so we control, we control the sale of alcohol within the centre. And the most important part is to give everybody an amazing time when they get there. So a, a great atmosphere. They tell their friends, their friends come along, they tell their friends, and before you know it, you have the snowball effect, which is exactly what we did in Newcastle. So in Newcastle, we had 1.3 million people through that site in 12 months. Seaburn, slightly different. It's destination. It's not in the city centre. Public transport isn't good. So it's either a taxi, walk, or you get dropped off. Um, and I think the numbers through that site are circa 800,000, which is pretty amazing for somewhere that isn't in the city centre. So a very popular um, uh, 
uh, destination. And just on that specific point, do you have people already expressing an interest to to come and operate with you? Yeah, we've had lots of inquiries for, for, for street food. So as soon as we go out into the press, they do a bit of research on us. Or you'd be amazed how many people know what stack is um, nationally. So, yeah, we get a lot of inquiries. Sorry, so the the the, uh, the buzz is, is, is quite good as, as far as we can see. Councillor Russell, please. Hello. Um, so I walk into the main foyer there and think this place is looking really grubby. Who's responsible for keeping the, the, the areas, the halls, the corridors around the entire building clean and tidy and litter free and making sure that there's a lot of litter bins around if people want to put sandwich packets or whatever? Yeah, we, we operate the site. So we, we clean the site, we, we provide the security for the site, we manage the site. Um, everything to do with the site is, is, is managed by us. Mm -hmm. So we don't bring in, um, we don't sublet everything and then there's a, there's a management team or an external management company who runs the site. We actually live and breathe and run the site. That's as well, does it? That goes for the third floor, does it? The, the student flats? Sorry, Councillor Russell, just to clarify, this this scheme doesn't include any residential. That was that was a previous one. Councillor Stone, first place. My question was a bit linked to that, actually. I was going to ask if you are going to have security there all the time, because one of the things I'm a bit nervous about um, is we seem to have an awful lot of children out of school at the minute who who you know this will be a magnet for them won't it um and i'm just wondering how we're going to make sure there aren't any safeguarding issues yeah i mean we you know we have safeguarding policies that we follow um security wise we would have somebody on site i wouldn't say every trading hour so i'm, I'm not sure we'd have somebody there for when the coffee shop is open for instance but the line shed of the hours we will have security on site have you got a policy about lone children yeah, that'll be within, within our safeguarding policy. Okay. Councillor James, I think I saw next. <laughs> Thank you. I, I don't really understand this business about the doors and the balconies. Uh, as I said, are they going to be open balconies with the uh, doors inset into the building that can, can shut and then leave the balconies empty, presumably overnight or, or whatever it is? for a number of reasons because one i know this site intimately as good as i know man has long before all of this stuff was here the wind does not blow on that spot hence the reason why the old hill peacock hotel and beat his place next door where i started work many years ago um you know why the it was very very weathered the buildings were very weathered and it's because of the prevailing winds and the fact of the way they face so, you know, it's going to be cold sitting up there drinking your coffee for a start off. Uh, and the other thing is, what about with the best will in the world? I mean, every town has got its yobbos and uh, people who try on. I can see people wanting to climb off that balcony or even attempt to climb up it as well. Uh, especially if they've been inside and pimped something or other, they'll come out there like a, you know, wrap it out of a hole and, and lower themselves down off the balconies. How are you going to deal with that problem? I suppose that's no different for any of our sites. You know, we they, they, they you know the one in Seaburn has has bifold doors on the front that face out the sea. And when the North Sea wind blows, blows. But we manage that very well. So we open the doors, we close the doors. The balcony here is is we don't have a breakout area. We don't have anywhere that somebody can go outside and get some air because it's a, it's it's basically a closed shopping centre. Um, so we've created the balcony so people could go outside and say, have a smoke, have a vape, get some fresh air. But the doors behind, will, and then there's a lobby behind that, I believe, will stop any wind going through into the centre. So it's to give them that outside area and also to improve the the front of the um, the scheme to be more, dare I say, leisure-based, because we don't want to, you know, we, we couldn't just go with the shopping centre front because it wouldn't work. Yeah. Oh, it's, it's a good idea. I can just see the... You know, the, the setbacks 
That's just how yep. we manage it. Just, you know. Councillor Manners, please. Th Thank you, Chair. Um, we res we got the Civic Society uh, note just before as we sat down. Have you had a chance to read that? We had a brief chance to look at it. And in terms of their examples that they suggested the design, what would your reaction be to that? Um, it's something we we can look at, but it's not. We haven't had the time to look at it with architects or anything like that. That we can't really comment on it. There's, you know, this is the way that Stack operate. It's it's been, um, you know, assessed by your officers, including your heritage team and things that they find it acceptable that that is kind of the basis that we're going on with this is the application in front of us today and their comments you know whilst we uh, are happy to review them it's it's difficult to kind yeah, of I mean, look at them my, my perspective is a mix of contemporary and heritage aspects taken into account can work mm -hmm. and all i'd ask is that you actually consider that um so i don't know whether the planning or, or the james you have a view um I think for for the purposes of this committee, we're looking to determine the application as presented before us. Um, so I, I don't think we're in a position to um, modify the design substantially as part of this this meeting. Sorry, could I just add to that as well? Sorry, sorry James, you didn't. I, I'm not. I'm not suggesting we sort of micro micro design. That's not where I'm coming from. I haven't actually mentioned any specific aspects, but I mean, in terms of the concept of in, in introducing those ideas, um, would would you be willing to consider that in your de deliberations with the um, with the applicant? I, I I think as James has kind of inferred, we're, we're obviously brought the application to committee with the plans as they are before us. Those those comments have literally come in this morning. Um, it, there's nothing to stop the applicant taking those away and considering them and coming back at a later stage if, if they want to take those on board and amend them. But we do have a, a, a duty to determine the application before us today. Councillor Gonzalez of Savage. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, and uh, welcome to Neil. Uh, thanks for coming to Northampton and uh, looking at our site and uh, bringing something new, uh, which I think is really important for both visitors and local people to enjoy. Um, a couple of things I, I raised earlier on about waste and how you'll handle waste or how you're planning on handling waste um, so that it doesn't ruin the, the really nice market square that's coming out here. So just your assurances that nothing will be wheeled out in terms of commercial bins and left outside the door. That would be really helpful, particularly on windy days. Um, and I, I note that uh, good colleague, Councillor James, has just indicated that it is a very windy spot. It is a windy spot. Um, so it would be useful. The other thing, just um, a couple of questions in terms of how green uh, your takeaway uh, policy is because quite clearly there'll be takeaways within the building, uh, food outlets uh, offering external food to be walked out. How green are those containers, those vessels? Um, that's useful. Um, and please, can you put some uh, bins outside in terms of not wheelie bins, but obviously bins that you can empty very close to the door area. So if people are just walking back and forwards, it, it's collected there and managed on your site. Um, that would definitely help and in a, in a small way. Planting, I, I guess we're looking at a, a, the plan that you're uh, that you've given us here today. Um, it's welcoming to see that. Not the trees, obviously. I appreciate they are um, their urban regeneration scheme uh, plans, but the plants that you have there on the balconies, uh, I'd welcome that they had. There was a maintenance scheme that you had to keep them going fresh. Whether you have to supplement them with, um, with some other architecture, but just to keep that you know, that break point, the softening scheme. And can you explain what's under the stack? What's it? There's a door there on the left hand side of stack. Um, the vertical stack uh that's it yes what what that is i only say that because clearly alcoves and places of that nature aren't particularly well used after hours um in public areas i'm, I'm sure our planning team have probably assessed that already but if you could just clarify that'd be very helpful thank you okay if, if i start with the waste so yeah the waste would be from the roof um i think the only reason that we would want to take bins out of the onto the market square would be if there was an issue with accessing the roof um, accessing the roof through the adjoining shopping centre is our rights. We acquired the lease of rights to be able to do that, so um, we can't be stopped doing that. So that, that's where the that's where the waste will will come from. I think on one of the earlier pictures is actually a waste a waste compactor there. So that's the type of thing that we use. Um, so that was the waste. Um, with regard to um, 
green. Uh, how green are we with regard to takeaway uh, containers, wooden forks, etc.? Um, it, it, it's 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 within the lease or the um, the under lease to the tenants that they 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 have to um, we have to approve what they use. So, um, and I think there's some new legislation coming out with regard to um, you know how we how we separate foods from 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 paper. Let's say so so that would all be complied with. Um, bins. There are lots of bins throughout the site, um, and there will be bins on the on the exits as well. Uh, and we, we we maintain them. That's exactly what we do with the other sites. Uh, litter picking as well. If we need to do litter picking in and around the area, we, we will do that as well. Um, and the green, yeah. The, so the planting, yeah. We throughout the site. Uh, if you if you if you googled one of the other sites, you'll see we have lots of planters throughout the site to bring that bit of uh, softness into the scheme where where it can be quite hard. So yeah, there's lots of lots of plants, lots of shrubs, um, which are all you know, lots of ongoing maintenance. Excellent. I have looked at other schemes, um, Mr. Chairman, on that, so I, I appreciate that that's how they're pictorially imaged. I haven't, haven't been to any other schemes, but it would be useful to see that there's some sort of planting scheme or some robustness there to keep it as, as good looking as it is. Um, and, I, and earlier comments about the heritage I'd absolutely super support. So if you can try and modify some of the woodwork, it's not a huge amount of cost by any means at all, would be helpful and, and it'd be a nod to the original building that was there. Um, and an element in terms of clearly the, there would be the market square, which I hope would be nice and active by the time you move in. Uh, it'd be really nice from a food mileage perspective that you were able to source some of the food products or encourage some of those outlets to source food immediately in front of them uh, from some of the market traders. And that would then help uh, in making it a viable scheme linked to local business. Thank you. Councillor Pritchard. Very quickly, Chair, uh, I appreciate it's not so much a planning inquiry, but uh, you did mention a few moments ago that there would be smoking on the balconies. Is that correct? I was going to yeah, that yeah. one, yeah. How are you going to manage that? That's yeah, concerning. Exactly. Um, well, we try and control the... We have, we have a controller within our, within our scheme, or people want to come out the front door, then we don't. Then we're not able to control it. So within the balcony, you'll see on the design, it has no... No roof, no sides, no front. So legally, yeah, we, we comply with the with the regulations. So the balcony will be used for people who want to go and have a smoke. Unfortunately, people still smoke; mm. they vape, um, and we have to try and uh, accommodate them. Otherwise, they come out of the center, out of the venue, and um, we don't then control them. One of the reasons that we asked for the twelve o'clock on the license was so we could control that, so that we. What, what, what we do in, in the other sites is when it gets very late at night, people go out for a cigarette. At a certain point, we won't let them back in the venue. It's time to go home if you're going out. We have the issue now where we've got 11 o'clock finish. Um, well, yeah, sorry, 11 o'clock for the balcony. So if somebody wants to smoke, we've got to let them out. 11 o'clock is too, too early for us to say, you can't come back in. So we're going to have this issue where people are going to be coming out after 11, say up to 12, and we're going to be letting them back into the back into the site, so well, that's the reason for the bargaining for the smoke. Mm. So there was a reason. There was a reason that we asked for the twelve. It wasn't, you know, it, it's it's to try and make it as, as run the site as best we can because we're we're pretty good at what we do, but we can't control people when they go outside. We can only control them within the venue. So my concern was discarding of cigarette ends off a balcony. Exactly. That's where I was coming from. I think that's just that's just a management how how we manage that yeah, it's yeah. Kind of different there to, to, to how we do it now. No, there's less smoking now, more vaping, so that's not an issue. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Thank you. Any more questions? There. Well, thank you both for undergoing that uh, interrogation. James, have you got any comebacks after that interchange? Um, no, thank you, Chair. I don't think we have any comments. Thank you. So we now move into the uh, open debate on this, and I'd invite Councillor Stone to commence the debate if she feels free. I'm really, I'm really pleased that this is coming forward. I think all the issues that have been raised, waste management, security, safeguarding, um, the, the movement of people around are still concerns, but they will be, won't they? I think trying to marry residential interests with commercial interests is always going to be tricky in an urban setting, but we know that that's what we want for the, for the town centre. So 
on balance, I approve of the scheme. Thank you. Councillor Harris. Yeah, thank you, Chair. I, I haven't got any specific um, issues in regards to um, planning objections. It's really some observations and comments, but I think they're they're worth making. My understanding is the market square was first occupied in 1235 as a market square, and the planners have done a fantastic job at preser preserving its heritage. I hope you detect my sarcasm in that. Uh, what disappoints me hugely is we have a market square that is extremely old. If you compare it to many of the other historic market squares across Europe, it bears no resemblance whatsoever. Now, I know this is this is historic arguments, but the point I think still needs to be made. Um, comments have been made by the agent that consideration to heritage assets has been made. They haven't, realistically. It's a completely different use. Um, I'm not against that. I understand there is a need to redevelop it, uh, to redevelop the town centre. Um, but if you compare it to somewhere like Krakow, which has got a market square that dates back to 1257, actually slightly younger than Northampton, it's entirely different. Um, and it, it just frustrates me, really, that, you know, we have this beautiful historic uh, square that, that over the ages, I'm not directing any fingers at any of our current planning team. It just disappoints me that we haven't taken account of these historic assets. And uh, you know, some of my council colleagues mentioned uh, whether there could be the opportunity to look, look at some of that historic context. Uh, you know, We have many villages in the area with conservation areas and Article 4 directions where you can't change the color of your front door without proper planning permission. Um, yet over the years, we've allowed this to happen to a, a gem of a square. So uh, it's not an objection. Um, it, it's just concerns, again, that we're not really reflecting our heritage. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Councillor Heron, please. Did you put your... oh. oh, was it you? Or was that Councillor Russell? I, I, didn't, I, I, I did want to say something, and I'm sorry. I, think you did. I, I didn't thought that we were just going one I by one. So but too. Yeah, um, but I, I am... Yes, it's going to bring um, vibrancy to the town and the evening economy, um, but I thought the condition 13 and those timings were very carefully thought out by the planners. And I think to give carte blanche to every unit here to sell alcohol till 2.30 in the morning, it, oh, I just we've got to think what kind of town we actually want. And the thought that you've got people who will still be drinking from 12 from midnight till 2 30 stumbling out of that place at three o'clock in the morning vomiting all over the place on the the beautiful um market square that we've spent a fortune to upgrade sleeping on benches and you've got the market traders coming in at presumably about six o'clock in the morning to set up the stalls and i just i just think we've got to think very carefully about what kind of town we want and i think the the timings were very carefully thought out by the by the officers and i think we should stick to those for the moment it doesn't stop you releasing um, or, or easing that over time when you see what the usage of that building is and, and and what the occupiers are going to use it for for instance if you had a private members club for instance that was very well controlled you might think that actually extending that till 2.30 in the morning might be acceptable. But to give carte blanche to everybody to actually have drinking establishments till 2.30 in the morning, when we have got, as, as Councillor Stone pointed out, residences around there, even the students, you know, if you, you're going to say it's party central till 2.30 in the morning, they never get any work done. I mean, it's not fair. And I don't think it's fair to the town and it's not something I would wish to sign up to. And I would like to propose that we stick to the timings that were originally agreed by the officers and then review it when when it's in use and look at whether there's any release of that over time uh, when we see how it's how it's operating. That's my thought. Thank you for your input. Councillor Russell, sorry. Now go. Thank you. Um, I, I think something new can always create controversy and and a sense of anxiety and awareness of of how how it's going to progress. Personally, I'm concerned about the impact it's going to have on the local economy and the night economy because there's a lot of pubs, restaurants, 
um, in that vicinity that are struggling at the moment without having this newcomer coming in. I'm not saying we shouldn't have it. I'm not saying that change isn't good, but I don't know where 200, we're going to find 250 people because apparently there's shortages of 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 um, workers. And I certainly wouldn't want to see some of our dearly loved restaurants and pubs folding because people like to sit outside in a smoky kind of environment um, at 2.30 in the morning. Thank you. Councillor Manu. Thank you, Chair. Um, I would certainly uh, support, I certainly support the development. I mean, I think the these type of developments do bring life to town centres. Um, I'm much less worried than Councillor Russell. I mean, basically, the more activities there are, the more good quality outlets there are, that draws people into the town centre for the evening. So I'm less worried about that. I certainly would concur with um, uh, Councillor Herring in terms of the timings. I'd prefer to keep to the original timings if possible. I think in terms of architecturally, this really doesn't do anything for me. And I don't think in 200 years time, God forbid, it's still, still around. It, our, 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 our forebear, our, sorry, our future forebears will be looking at it thinking, gosh, we did a really good job of proving this. This is architecturally very light. I think the market square has been absolutely ruined, as Councillor Harris said. Um, and sadly, this does nothing to enhance it. Um, I think the changes to the market square that have been put in at the moment are extremely good. Um, I just wish this this development enhanced it, and I don't see it. But I'm fully supportive of the development in principle. Thank you. Councillor Pritchard, please. Right. I, I also am very encouraged with regards to this particular type of development, and particularly with the expertise and listening to some of the other sites that, in fact, these developers have actually opened. <laughs> The good thing that encourages me is not so much the nighttime economy, and I also agree with some of these opening hours, because quite frankly, if somebody wants to drink till, as some of the establishments in Northampton are open till four in the morning, they can go there. But the thing that does encourage me is, in fact, that during the day, you're going to have families, children, entertainment, singing, and all local uh, activities that's going to take place in this particular area. So I would actually uh, recommend that I would, uh, I would actually approve of this application with some of the limitations on opening hours. Thank you. <laughs> yes, because I was the Thank you, Mr Chairman. Well, I, I'd like to do um, something which is to absolutely uh, recommend this for approval. I think it's the right thing to do. Uh, we do need to create a destination. We do have a, a huge uh, need to bring more facilities and more selection back into towns and our cities of the of the country. And I do think that it is it's a today offering. It's not something for 200 years' time, I absolutely agree. Heritage-wise, it doesn't really do an awful lot, but at the end of the day, uh, it does from a destination perspective, From it does from a, a, a um, an entertainment and a hospitality perspective, it does do that. And we have obviously a very large uh, contingent of students not too far away um, who are based at the university and many colleges around the area. Um, I do have the same concern as Councillor Stone uh, earlier uh, raised about um, children coming out during the day and congregating. I think this is an important point that we we need to make sure there's a loan uh, children policy there or something that's managed carefully because it will be a mecca effectively because it will have a, a good offering. I mean, currently the, the food offering in Northampton is not very good. So I think hopefully this will definitely improve it. Um, a couple of things that came about, we were looking at the stack uh, sign on the left-hand side there and the enclosed alcove or the, the setback doors that I mentioned. I didn't quite get an answer from that uh, from the applicant. Uh, apologies, but I wouldn't mind just having that secured in some way, even if that's bringing it forward, um, as some of the properties have already done so in around the market square, because um, even with different public space orders, um, antisocial behaviour is uh, very much something we're all concerned about, and uh, particularly in the market square. So it would be nice to have that completely flush so there wasn't an, an enclosed space. Um, the other point that the applicant confirmed that waste would be removed from the roof only. Uh, I'd like to make sure that we, we caveat that as a condition, not because they will ab abuse that by any means at all, but I think it's much more um, comforting to realise that we won't have anything on our market square um, with all the investments gone into it. In terms of the hours, um, I go along with colleagues, um, unless the applicant has themselves 
uh, approached um, our officers, Mr. Chairman, to extend it to 2.30 with, with good reason. Um, and I think from the explanation that was given earlier on to extend it to midnight and have the, the individuals not re-entering the building seemed like quite a sensible approach. Um, I certainly think that we should be welcoming to visitors and we need business in our towns. The economy is driven by people having an experiential time and this is one of them. So I think we should be proud about bringing back business to the, to the, uh, the town and the market square. It is difficult, I appreciate it, but they are coming to invest. I think if we can encourage that um, together with the Abandon Street revival, I think it's really important. I'd like to see them as part of the community and from what they were saying, they do take part in many of those community activities rather than just uh, a food and drink offering. Thank you. And don't forget, we're a proud uh, owner of the purple flag in the town which reflects that, our nighttime economy already at the weekends, and that's one of only 100 in the world. So we are quite well there, and this will only enhance what we're doing. I, I get the feeling, trying to summarise what's going on, that we, in principle, are very happy with this application, but there's this waste condition and, and the timing thing. I'd appreciate more input on people that haven't spoken on the timing aspect. Councillor Clark, thank you. Uh, I've I've listened very carefully to the debate and it's been an interesting one and members have raised their concerns and we've had responses from officers and the applicant and so on. I can see where you're heading with this, Chairman, and I would be inclined to support you in your efforts to get a proposal. I, I'm just trying to see how deeply the committee feel about this two, oh, sorry, 12 versus 2.30 timing. Councillor Purser, how do you feel? Uh, my thought is that that is better controlled through the licensing committee's work and and that to have them aligned is there is some benefit to having the timings aligned so that so that there's a consistent time between the planners and the licensing committee it's then for the licensing committee and its officers to determine that the premises is well managed and it's not causing any problems to the surrounding area and so my that would be my uh, position to follow our officers' advice on on this on this matter. So you'd be happy to go with the losses and determining uh, the precedent in effect. Yes. Okay. The question by the applicant for two thirty. No, but the licensing is already approved. But did it? Why did it change? Who 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 asked? Yeah, for Nikki, it? Nikki, help me. Right. <laughs> <laughs> So, so just to clarify, there's a license application in at the moment and the opening times within the license application are 8 to 2.30 every day of the week. So that's under consideration. The consultation period for the license closed yesterday and there have been no objections received on, on the opening times. Mm. And and just to clarify that Council Purse is correct in, in that the, the license can be subject to review and there, there's several safeguards in terms of and social behaviour and continued monitoring under the licence agreement as, as well. So can I ask you... Any, any views at all? Have the police raised the, any views? The, the, the police have been involved in, in the discussion on the licensing. And they have no objections? They've not raised objections. Any, or any, any view or expressed on that? I've not been party to their views, but speaking to the licensing, um, I'm a colleague in licensing there, I'm, I'm, they advise that the police had been involved. And I think that's a standard procedure anyway for them to be involved in discussions. Can I take help on my right on this one then? Thank you, Chair. Um, the position is that for planning purposes, you can have different hours to licensing purposes. It would then be a matter for the applicants to um, um, ensure that they complied with the planning permission um, in the first instance. Obviously, if they then went with the licensing hours, they would be in, in contravention, assuming they, they go along different hours, they would then be in contravention of planning and subject to enforcement through planning. And equally, if they um, 
went along with planning, they would just be clipping their wings effectively through licensing um, conditions. So it would then, if you had those two sets, it would be a matter for the applicant as to how they wish to proceed. And if they aligned with licensing, planning would be in a position if they felt it was appropriate to do so to enforce the planning side of matters. But it's not an ideal situation for anybody. It would be more sensible if somehow or other the, the two do align but you can have that situation where you get permission for planning in one set of hours and you get licensing on a different and then the applicant has to decide which way to proceed thank you catherine i want to move to go with the licensing side of it because i feel they're the experts i'm about to counsel the person there i think that's their particular field i'm trying to Go against them, I don't think it's productive necessarily. Councillor Prichard, please. Thank you, Chair. C could I propose that we accept this particular application and also uh, leave it in the hands of our licensing committee to determine what is appropriate for this establishment? Do we have a seconder for that proposal? Thank you, Councillor Mathers. Councillor James, please join yes, us. I'll go along with that because uh, when we were told the market square was going to be revamped, uh, one of the things which uh, they used to sell it was the fact that there would be events going on on the market square as well from time to time. Yeah. And presumably, some of those events may require licensing. I don't know. Mm -hmm. So you could end up, if we get involved in, in licensing matters, uh, creating a huge contradiction. So it's best, I think the entire thing is best left to them and them alone. Really? Thank you. Just to sum up, I, I believe you've covered everything, but I don't want to miss any condition. There's certainly a waste condition. Now, do we believe we've got that covered, James, or do we need to be more specific on that? Yeah. Um, we, we have a waste condition and we can certainly take on, but I, I, I feel slightly cautious at this stage without speaking to refuse colleagues and also the applicant about completely prohibiting at this stage any... Um, refuse onto the market square i think but we can certainly take that away for discussion can i just ask that we had no commercial bins deposited on the market square if we made that quite clear they could if they had to move one out <laughs> for easy access and it was not a permanent fixture because some of the areas behind guild hall as a prime example there the road is full of commercial bins and when one starts there'll be a precedent set and we'll end up with a market square full of commercial bins Okay. Go ahead, please. Thank you, Chair. Uh, we we do have a proposal in, in before members for discussion today for debate, um, and that contains a condition as as set out before members. It doesn't include the condition that you're looking to um, uh, enhance. Um, that can be taken back for discussion, but there isn't. That isn't what is before members today for dis for consideration and determination. Um, so we'd need to be careful about because we. I think I believe that we don't know quite yet what those arrangements will be because we don't yet know who is going to be in 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 situ at any given time for the um, units and what what will or won't be achievable in that respect so i think we might struggle um again on 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 conditions to um add a requirement that may or may not be achievable um once we know more details about the proposed occupiers and tenants and that's where we have a difficult we would have a difficulty adding that requirement through you, Chair. If that was the case, then obviously we would be setting a precedent and we've got to be very careful because it looks stunning. It's coming out really beautifully, the uh, the market square, and I'm absolutely sure we don't want to encourage any permanent waste bins there of that of that commercial type, the wheelie ones. I'm talking about those big canisters yeah. that look horrendous, definitely. Um, the element we also, you know, quite readily accept is that they themselves, the applicants, is indicated would be a roof collection and they'd be using a roof compacting system as well. So it would be one of those things to, and they could always come back to planning if at the end of the day something had to happen, but we just, we just can't start off with a commercial bin opportunity being uh, stacked up here outside. That, that was, Can we go ahead with that? was one of the things you. which that was one of the things which the original 1961 Peacock Way avoided because next to Beethoven House was 
an entrance uh, to Beatty's sale room and yard, mm. and the bins were kept up there mm. in that yard to all the shops that were in Peacock Way, mm. including Victor Value Supermarket as well. Mm. Their big bins were kept in the yard of Beatty's auction room next door to Beethoven House. But li listening to the applicant, it, it seemed to me that any generated waste was going to go upwards, compacted then out to the Groden Centre, so there would be no need for commercial type bins because they're going to provide their own stylish bins or whatever kind of bins they like around the site and at the entrance, and they're going to do the, they're going to manage that themselves. So we need to make absolutely sure, though, Chair, don't we? Because it would be intolerable, yes. to be honest with you. We just can't have it. I, I fully accept what you're saying, Councillor Stone. Yes. Mm -hmm. Nikki, help. And also, what we discussed the, the uh, Memorial Days. Those two Memorial Days, Armistice Day and uh, Remembrance Sunday, in terms of live music. Catherine, please. Yeah, just on, on that that particular point, I have looked at um, conditions on those bases, that bases, and I can't find anything that would support us in providing a condition um, specifically for, for that purpose. Um, and a, the um, condi statutory conditions that are required um, has to be necessary, has to be relevant to planning. Um, has to be relevant to the development to be permitted, enforceable, precise and reasonable in all other respects. I think we might be struggling to secure it, unfortunately, through a planning condition. I think that's quite reasonable to request that on Armistice Day and Remembrance Sunday, particularly as they're overlooking the Memorial Gardens of All Saints Church. I, I genuinely feel that. I wouldn't raise it otherwise, but it is such an important couple it's of days in our calendar. Say it's not, sorry, Councillor, it's not to say that it's not unreasonable to ask the business to be respectful, but that doesn't mean we can um, encompass it in a planning condition. But I'll hand that over to Simon. My, my, I have my concerns that we may not be able to put a sufficiently robust um, condition. And the risk you have then is that we put a condition in and it is then applied for to be removed or modified. And so we still have no condition at the end of that, that process. Shall we ask the applicant back for a couple of moments? Oh, just um, as a suggestion. So first of all, you're looking at potentially removing condition 13 because you you're thinking that that's best controlled the suggestion is that might be best controlled through licensing the actual hours mm -hmm. of operation right then you've got condition 14 that says the land hereby approved should only be operated in accordance with the noise mitigation measures recommended in the acoustic report that the applicant submitted and then when you actually look at that acoustic report, it does say that they won't have amplified music until the afternoon on any day anyway. So indirectly, you wouldn't expect to hear any amplified music anywhere in the premises in the morning on any day. So their own acoustic report says that we will have <coughs> DJs and karaoke and whatever else that, that might be permitted but it won't start until the afternoon hours anyway so it's so by inference i would suspect that very unlikely would you hear any amplified music on armistice day or bank holiday or, or, or the 11th the 11th november or remembrance sunday and it's covered by indirectly by that by that submission because i think uh, the legal advice is correct i don't think it would be reasonable for us to specify a planning reason as to why we would prohibit anything on those okay. particular I, I wasn't privy to that uh, acoustics report, so uh, I appreciate might, you've seen that. That might be the way around that, because it does have its own controls in the acoustic report that they've submitted. Thank you for that. Nikki, back to the bins. <laughs> <laughs> Always back to the bins. Um, so, so suggestion to amend condition 12, um, for them to submit a scheme for storage and collection of waste and recycling incorporating measures to restrict waste collection from Market Square. Is the committee happy yep. to set that Agreed. up? Thank you. Thank you. Sorry, Councillor Herring. I, I just want to say that I can support it with those original timings, but I, I just can't support the 2.30. And don't forget that um, the decision that we make here will be used to influence the um, licensing committee because they'll say, oh, planning didn't have any problems with it till 2.30. That's absolutely fine. And I just think that we've spent all this money and we want a, we want a high-class destination. But if you are going to put out 
to all of those um, likely occupiers of this site that they can serve booze till 2.30 in the morning, you will be attracting the wrong type and you will be bringing in, um, and it's let's face it, it's all about money. They can make a lot more money selling Jaeger bombs between 12 and, and 2.30 in the morning. Um, and I just think it was very carefully thought out by the officers in the first place, and that's what I can uh, approve and support. But I think any movement from that, I think, should be done carefully and slowly when we actually see it in operation. It doesn't mean to say it's it's in stone forever, but it does mean that the we see it in operation first before we release the brakes, if you like, if you think that um, 2.30 is a reasonable time and everything's being controlled properly. But I think it, you're just giving carte blanche and I, I, I would be very sad to see what the result to our town would be. So I couldn't support it and and uh, I couldn't support it with the amended times. Thank you. Councillor Chalmer. Thank you, Mr Chairman. I just wanted to reassure my colleagues that the licensing committee is not at all influenced by the planning committee. <laughs> oh, I was I was further going to say they're a very professional committee. I'm sure they've got minds of their own, so I would support what you're saying, councillors. So we appear to got to a point where we with the amendment relating to that we've been given by Nikki relating to the waste disposal management plan if you want to call it that do we have a proposal taken on that amendment that's council I'll, I'll propose that with the amendment that we've discussed. do we have a seconder councillor james all those who are in favor of the proposal with that amendment please show now those against and is anybody abstaining Thank you. That is carried, and thank you very much indeed. Thank, thank you for the attendees at the back, most useful. We now move on to item six on the agenda, the land at Norwood Farm, Sandy Lane, Harpole. It's Chris. I see him wandering about outside. I, I think he's loitering with intent.
Okay, thank you, uh, committee. We're on now to item six, and I'd ask Chris Burton to present that for us, please. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, councillors. Uh, so I'm presenting to you 2023-4-6293-4-RM. This is a reserved matters application at Norwood. So there's um, already an approved outline, and uh, the, which is a hybrid application. Uh, there was also a number of other approved matters on here, which I will just draw your attention to before I start. So there's a reserve matters approved for provision of site-wide road, surface water and foul water drainage infrastructure and associated landscaped open space. Uh, there's also reserve matters approved for the provision of sports pitches, pavilion, country park, play areas and open space. Uh, there's also two discharged conditions, one which is the design code um, and the other which is the phasing plan, which are pertinent to this reserve matters application. So this is our red line. Um, if you note KP16, which is a bridal way, um, I will discuss that in a little bit more detail later. Um, and the aerial image of, uh, of the field, obviously there's been some construction around there now, if you're aware of the site, including to the south of the red line. So this is the Norwood phasing plan. Uh, so we're discussing 2B. Um, which unhelpfully, uh, sorry members, I've slightly cut off, which is down to the south. Uh, we can see slightly more detail here. So this is the area which we're talking about. So this is the outline parameter plan, which is approved. And where my mouse is, is the area. The star is a suds pond, which you'll note as sort of as an orientation point when we look at the, um, at the plan. And then this is the spine road running through the whole of the site here. So this is the sud pond where that star is, just to orientate yourself there. And it's this site, phase 2B, which is the um, uh, what the art reserve matters is for. If we look down to the south of the suds pond, our main objection originally came from highways. So we had a highways objection regarding the bridle way and the surfacing. Um, I've got a slightly zoomed in slide here. If you note the suds pond, uh, there's a, I suppose, a pinch point uh, at this location, which reduces the bridle way down to about two meters. It's meant to be a shared surface for cyclists, pedestrians, and for horse uh, equestrian uh, use. Across the rest of the site, we have a shared pathway. It, it meets highway standards. Um, you can see it slightly further to the west here, where we've got hogging, which is a sort of dirt that's compressed material for the horses to use, and then tarmac for the cyclists and pedestrians. At this pinch point, the original submission turned to tarmac, and it was for all uses, so equestrian, cyclists, and for um, pedestrians, the gradient is uh, uh, existing as well, quite steep. The issue then becomes, what can we do to open that up? Um, and we sit here with an attenuation basin to the north, which is already approved, built, and has water in it. And to the south, we have ownership issues with Homes England. Uh, so the, the original plan, was to create a waiting area for horses. Of course, the problem with that sits is, will they wait? Uh, also a tarmac surface is, especially on a gradient, potentially quite dangerous um, uh, during the winter. So we've got the potential for skidding, et cetera. So after a lot of discussion with our highways colleagues, with the applicant um, working around how to resolve this, the preferred option, or uh, well, sort of the, preferred, the option in front of you is that the cycle path diverts at this point so it continues as a bridle way with hogging up to the pegasus crossing and at this point we have another option for the cyclists and pedestrians to take which then links back up again um all on a cycle path pedestrian link as it's a bridle way currently 
you are more than welcome to continue cycling on the hogging. Obviously, it's not potentially the, the preferred material for cyclists, but if you're a keen cyclist, you can continue on that route. But the diversion gives a, a separate alternative upon which horses won't be traveling um, to go and uh, travel on. Uh, you'll note we've also included a condition in the late update as recommended by our highways colleague to include signage there just to make it clear to everyone um, how it splits and and how the alternative route potentially work, well, does work. We had an uh, objection from the British Horse Society to the original plan. I did reconsult with this new amendment. No objection came forward from the British Horse Society. Um, they, they didn't comment on the change. Instead, they requested uh, a further bridal way um, or sort of inclusion of, of land to become a bridal way on land outside of the red line. Um, it's an issue I passed on to our highways and the uh, public footpath team to, to have a look at, but it's not one that we can uh, facilitate as part of this application. But I, I don't have a, a new comment from them regarding the, the changes proposed, but they were consulted upon it. So moving on, this is the approved illustrative open space. Again, you'll notice the suds pond, so you can sort of orientate yourself on our phase. So th this was approved uh, under a previous reserve matters. And here we sit with the materials plan. So you've got the main spine road, and we have a design code as well, which was as approved. The um, design code places most of this site in the urban core. Part of the west, so the west facing part here is part of the rural core. So um, most of this site fits in our design code as uh, urban. Here we have some street scenes. So the top three street scenes are all part of the urban core with the bottom street scene being that of the rural core. The yellow sort of highlighted areas is the affordable housing. There are 18 affordable housing proposed, which is equal to 15%. Now there's a section 106, so this is in accordance with the section 106. Strategic housing were consulted. They're happy with the mix. They're happy with the tenure split. Um, there was a bit of discussion in regards to not having a cluster of affordable housing, but you'll note there's two separate roads on which the affordable housing are. So even though they're sort of centered around a road, there's two separate frontages. Uh, also important to note that strategic housing are happy that all the affordable housing is tenure blind. And by that, I mean, there's no difference in materials. There's, you, you wouldn't know if it was an affordable house or a market house, it's, it's a tenure blind scheme. So here we have a couple of images I've taken uh, in regards to sort of the house type. So you have the urban core. So a lot of the, again, with, with the design code sets out what we're expecting in terms of density. Um, predominantly there's a push for brick uh, with a bit of white render in the, um, in the urban core. And this is a dwelling type from the rural section. So slightly more render, uh, a bit more stone, which you'll see in the next dwelling as well for the rural uh, rural section as well. So having reviewed the reserve matters, um, it's important to remember that we don't have maybe sometimes as much scope in terms of uh, discussing design etc we have a signed off design code we have a section 106 and we have an outline we have a number of other reserve matters already signed off such as open space um your offices have reviewed this application they've compared it to the section 106 and the other signed off applications uh, and its officers view that this application is in compliance with those matters uh, and therefore we are recommending approval yes thank you uh, do any members have questions of the officer? Yes, Councillor Harris. 
Yeah, just just a couple of comments in in the notes. There are um, a couple of agencies that have comments, not objections. Um, just really want to clarify what the situation is with with those local flood authority, which of course is us, I presume. Um, still waiting for information. I'm not sure whether that's been ticked off or not. There's a, a comment for uh, regarding archaeology and a comment from Environment Agency. All seem to be uh, certainly two of those seem to be linked. So I just wonder if you give us an update on what the situation is with those. Thank you. Councillor, apologies, I should have started with the LLFA update. So thank you for bringing it up. Um, I did provide a late update. So the LLFA have maintained, so lead local flood authority have maintained their objection to the scheme. They've requested further information be submitted. Um, the way reserve matters works is you can discharge conditions within the reserve matters by submitting that information. Uh, a lot of work has already gone into the flood risk assessment for the site, uh, and obviously we have a drainage reserve matter signed off. So officers are, are relatively happy that drainage is a matter that can be dealt with. We're not dealing with an in-principle objection. Uh, to let the scheme move forward, but to give the LLFA time to get comfortable and for the applicant to submit all information, we have removed the drainage documents as approved documents and have informed the applicant that they will need to submit those as a separate discharge of condition. So those conditions, there's three of them, uh, do not allow development to commence until the local authority is satisfied that drainage has been dealt with. So we can completely control it still. Obviously from the applicant side, it's easier, the more they can sort of discharge in the RMs, uh, it, it sort of just ticks boxes earlier on for them, but we still control all drainage matters. Uh, the and the LFA will have to be satisfied and remove their objection before the scheme can progress. Uh, on top of the three controlling conditions, there's a separate verification condition. So the applicant will then, once they commence and build out the scheme, will have to verify that what they've said they're doing works as well. Um, the Environment Agency, uh, I think the applicant will update, um, I hate to pass the baton straight to them, but the applicant will update you regards to the Environment Agency. I did ask them to provide an update it's not an objection, as you say, but obviously it requires addressing. Um, it's nothing that we could refuse an application on, but I understand the need to have that information. Um, archaeology, that was a, say, not an objection. I think there was concern that information hadn't been provided. Again, there's a condition on the outline that requires discharge. I think archaeology would have liked that information to have been submitted as part of the RM. It's within the gift of the applicant to submit that information as and when. And I was aware of correspondence between the applicant's archaeologist and the authority's archaeologist um, in which they were satisfied that things were moving forward and that they'd be provided with the information required to discharge the archaeology condition successfully so it's um it's it's we we have a lot of reliance still on the outline conditions um in terms of having these matters satisfactorily dealt with thank you councillor councillor gonzalez savage please thank you mr chairman um afternoon chris i wonder if you can give us a bit of an update in terms of the the width of land that was required that you were indicating in terms of that that restricted junction element with uh, highways uh, with um, uh, Homes England. Um, I'm just wondering whether any conversation has taken place with Homes England about it. I didn't see them within the papers. And the other, in terms of this, is that we're also place shaping and place making. And um, the majority of the, of the housing there, I would suggest personally, is not in an urban setting. Um, uh, and is more certainly more rural than urban, but it does, or possibly I misinterpreted it from your. Um, uh, presentation there that there is more urban than rural in terms of the character of the, of the development there um and how good it would be if some of the um the additional affordable housing effectively was in the urban uh, sorry was in the rural uh section because of the the setting effectively thank you thank you councillor um so I, the current width is about two meters required width is about six meters so we, so I, I've been corrected before in saying impossible because nothing's impossible. We can always try and find a solution, but it's the practicality of that solution. Uh, what the first thing we examined was the suds pond. So can we take land from that? Um, it's approved. Um, it, that that was a a matter for a different application, and I'm, I'm sure it could be 
criticised now, but it is where we are, unfortunately. It's in operation. Um, it would be astronomical in terms of putting that water elsewhere um, and then taking land from that. Uh, the, you know, the engineering operation would, would, would be excessive. Um, the applicant was kind enough to provide some sort of sketch work in terms of making a flat gradient, et cetera, so it was suitable for all users. And it, it's a huge land under operation. Um, I've spoken to the applicant a couple of times regarding Homes England, um, and I'm sure they'd be happy to update as well. But, but I think there is a difficulty in large agencies in terms of securing land, um, especially with timescales. Uh, and I think there's been, I say politely, a reluctance in previous sort of engagements in terms of securing any agreement between parcels. Um, it's it's an option, but it, it was very strongly put to us that it was a very unviable option that would see a lengthy delay um, to the delivery of this phase if it was explored and could eventually be uh, dealt with. Uh, in regards to the um, sort of design rural and urban core, you are, you are right, most of the site, it sits within the, the urban core. I, I, I'm sort of drawn back to, to the members who were here when we discussed Overstone Lays back in May last year. Um, unfortunately, a lot of taken away in terms of decision making, a lot of reserve matters, especially when conditions and other reserve matters have been discharged, almost sit within a sort of compliance to what's previously been agreed. Uh, the condition, I think it's condition six is the design parameters, design code. The applicant has met the design code, which has been signed off for the entirety of the site. Um, it may be that some of the site could sit sort of more within the rural core, but the applicant has met their duty. They've submitted as per the design code. Um, and it's it's it, without trying to sort of say there's not much we can do. There's there's not much we can do. The applicant has abided by the parameters provided to them and has 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 ticked every box in that sense. With affordable housing, um, it's it's an interesting constant sort of discussion. I think in terms of theory, there's there's a there's a wish to pepper pot to affordable houses. But affordable housing providers are very reluctant to take pepper potted houses. They they want cause. So even though we would like to see more pepper potting, it, it's that core that sort of uh, that, that sits together that the affordable housing providers want to take on. Um, if we start moving to the rural housing in terms of the affordable housing, um, and much of the rural housing is of much larger um, sort of size, it's four bed, et cetera, whereas the, the requirement that strategic housing have required and obviously the applicants met is for, for smaller houses. So it does start to change that design, I think, if if we push that affordable housing into the rural housing setting. Um, as the predominance of the, the affordable housing is smaller housing, it's going to naturally sit within the urban core. And then some of the larger, well, I think there's two, four beds off the top of my head, um, they're, they're going to sit next to the other affordable housing uh, so that they they contain that sort of cluster area. So without disagreeing with you, councillor, um, I, I think that unfortunately that the, the way it has to function is, is, is how we have it in front of us. Okay, thank you. Any more questions? Yes, councillor Purser, as long as it's not about affordable housing. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'm very sad that the affordable housing issue, that we're down at 15%. I understand that boat has sailed, the door is shut, but but there we are. Um, but I th it's laying up problems for us as a committee in the future and as, as an authority in the future, but that's sufficient. To Second point is I'm concerned about the flooding issue and, and within its sort of broader context, which is the impact on the Nen Valley kind of below the town and the fact that as we harden the landscape to the west of the town, um, we're getting more flow off into the river and this is causing some of our problems lower down. 
So I, I'm wanting, I don't think, I understand that in a way this has been dealt with in terms of the design, but, but I think it's a matter for us to make sure as developments come forward that we're not adding to the problems that we've got with flooding uh, no and above, um, because that, that is a real concern that it's, it's the landscape hardening that we're doing is, is adding to our problems. Point well made. Do you want to comment on that, Chris? Uh, yes, I will just jump back to the affordable housing and your, your concern. Um, the Section 106 contains a clawback clause. So viability has been submitted by the applicant. The local authority submitted, uh, sorry, has accepted that viability in, in terms of the deliverable affordable housing. But as part of the Section 106, there is a clause um, which is triggered at, I think, 800 houses. If the viability is not as set out previously, the local authority can claw back um, funds for affordable housing. So it, it does help in that the applicant has the confidence of moving forward with a viable scheme, but the local authority can pursue, uh, well, not pursue, because it would be part of the, so it's not a, it, it would be an amicable sort of position that the applicant has made X, X number of funds via the scheme. Therefore it, it triggers more affordable housing. So it, it helps bring the scheme forward, but it means that the local authority has that you know, ability to look at more affordable housing in the future. So th there is there is something that, um, in terms of the the flood risk, obviously we have the outline flood risk assessment, uh, which is approved, and we have the reserve matters drainage approved. Um, for this scheme, we hold the FFLA objection. Um, I'm more than happy to pass those comments on to the FFLA because ultimately the applicant will have to submit the drainage information again to discharge the condition. So I can make sure that's noted um, when they're examining it because as per the MPPF, you can't increase flood risk elsewhere. You can't just solve your own flood problem. You, you can't increase it elsewhere. So I will, I will make sure that's passed on for the discharge of condition. And it is upstream in Northampton. So anything that happens in the West is going to go through Northampton, isn't it? Councillor Pritchard. Uh, thank, thank you, Chair. Uh, on page 72, with the affordable housing type and mix, you've you've using the term intermediate, and I haven't come across that term. What does that really mean? Page seventy-two. I must confess, I, <laughs> I I do know the definitions, but put on the spot. Um, I looked at Nikki just in case she's a. <laughs> Um, so if effectively, it, it could be something like shared ownership. There, there, there's different definitions. So it's it's not completely affordable rented. It's kind of there is there is a defined um, level of market value associated with it. But it's um, as I say, shared ownership is probably the, the main example I can think of. And, and the very last question, and this is sort of overall, when you look at this particular development, this SUE, it's one of the things where you've got an enormous amount of developers, and we're talking about a 15% affordable housing. Who actually calculates the amount of affordable housing that actually is put together with all these developers? It would initially have been done by the applicant who submitted the outline. So... Uh, vast, vast spreadsheets um, would be submitted mm. with uh, engineering costs, uh, uh, infrastructure costs, um, and then uh, very briefly they work out a, I don't know, two thousand pound a square foot build cost, uh, and then work out a sales cost on top. Mm. Developers are obviously entitled to make a profit yeah. around. Oh, I'm I appreciate that, but it, it's just that, you know, when we try and look at 15% of affordable housing, it actually is calculated that particular amount. And also, when you've seen some of the other uh, applications in this particular development that have come in, some of them actually have come in with no affordable housing on it. And it was just making sure that the overall development has 15% of affordable housing. It does different phases have different requirements in terms of affordable housing so some uh, the strategic housing have uh pointed out in their commentary some parts of the development will have a higher concentration of affordable housing some have none so it's the overall percentage um and the application applicant in this case meets their share in terms of this phase but obviously as we get each phase in they're assessed against the requirements for that phase 
Right, if there's no more questions, I'll invite um, our speakers. I'll invite Councillor Adam Brown to come forward to the podium as... No, no, Councillor. Adam Brown. <laughs> yeah, we'll come to you, we'll come to you. <laughs> Thank you, Adam. You've got five minutes and I'll give you a minute to go warning if you get that far. Uh, I won't take up all of that time. Uh, okay. Chairman, uh, thank you firstly to uh, to Chris Burt and the planning officer for walking me through the uh, the issues around the bridle path uh, immediately prior to the meeting. I hadn't been able to see details of the late submission. Uh, I know to some it will seem like a, a minor point, but the maintenance of bridle paths and access to them is an important uh, aspect of rurality and the, uh, the environment of, of rural areas. And I think that the solutions put forward uh, under the uh, application before us are are acceptable, um, especially the new materials. Uh, I don't speak on behalf of the British Horse Society, obviously, but uh, uh, certainly from my perspective, and I believe uh, Harpole pa Parish Councils, it, it would seem like a, a reasonable uh, compromise. Um, I would like to stress the, <clears throat> uh, the concerns around flooding. Now, for those who don't know uh, Harpole and the surrounding area, there's a very steep incline uh, along the entire course of, of, of this development. And the fact of the matter is that all of this development land uh, until recently was arable land. So had an ob obviously high capacity to, to soak up uh, rainwater. So that's the fact. The perception uh, since the development has started is that flooding in the South View area uh, of Harpole and on the A4500 uh, around the Kislingby roundabout has been significantly worse uh, than in the past. And residents fear that it's, that it's because of runoff water uh, that was previously being soaked up by, by the arable land. Uh, so I, I feel... I feel that we, we absolutely need to hold the developer to account in making sure that the uh, the LF, LLFA is is satisfied uh, because we, we know that the concerns that residents everywhere have uh, about uh, new developments taking up floodplain or land that previously soaked up rainwater and the potential impact on uh, pre-existing communities as well as the new communities being built. Uh, I'm not going to go over the affordable housing issue, uh, Chairman, only to say that uh, as a council uh, within my portfolio, we are working to make our uh, viability assessments more robust so that we can better hold developers to account. Um, I am, however, slightly uh, perturbed by the uh, by the clustering of uh, of the affordable housing in the development. Um, you know, we have a policy uh, in in the local plan, uh, and you know that policy exists for a reason. Uh, I've read the papers, I see that strategic housing uh, have accepted it to uh, to facilitate the uh, the layout of the site, but I do find it hard to believe that it, it's somehow beyond the wit of man to, uh, to, to lay out the site in such a manner that these properties can't be pepper potted around. Um, <laughs> And I also just have a further uh, a further query about a comment within the report uh, uh, in relation to parking. Uh, in the context of the affordable housing, it goes on to say that the parking provisions across the site uh, will, uh, will, will be varied ac across property types. So whilst the properties and their external facades may be tenure blind, uh, is there the potential for the parking provisions outside the affordable properties to diminish the uh, the tenure the ten blind nature of those properties i.e you know, will you be will you be able to identify the affordable properties because of a lesser uh, lesser provision of parking uh, because that that would that would concern me uh, in it just because someone's in an affordable uh, home it doesn't mean that they don't have um, access to a car uh, quite frequently they'll have access to several cars just as uh, other properties will and in parts of the site uh, the roads are only I believe three is it three point eight meters wide or possibly a little wider but your average um, uh, your average sort of small uh, hatchback is one point eight meters wide so as soon as you have start uh, cars stacking up outside the street you you end up with a, ne a very very narrow thoroughfare uh, so I'd like some reassurances around. Uh, the, the parking provisions on the affordable housing and just whether we can get any movement on the clustering of the affordable homes because I, I do think that we're having our pants pulled down by the developer a touch on this and but number one here is the, uh, the the flood issues we need to be very very strong uh, on that for the sake of all the residents in the local area 
Okay, thank you. I'm going to remain seated for questions from our members. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Mr Chairman. Um, uh, Councillor Brown, I uh, absolutely appreciate your mentions in terms of the 10-year blind scenarios and the parking outside properties. I, I do know of a development fairly close to uh, my area uh, that has effectively the number of the property outside and a V on the additional space, uh, which is which is effectively identifying visitor space, sure, and the number of the of the house, but that's not happening in areas very close to it with private housing is only happening in the affordable housing. So I absolutely agree with you on that. And I would not like to see any sort of identification um, like that, which is literally sprayed onto the ground or, or white painted onto the ground in, uh, close to the properties. Um, and it, it does give a stigma in terms of that particular scenario. I also do think, and I appreciate we've heard earlier on about the pepper potting situation. I do think actually that is the right thing to do. Um, although I appreciate from a business perspective, it's great to handle it on block. Um, but it isn't from a community perspective the, the, the right way to live. Uh, it does create ghettos or, or, or areas that are, start to be framed with particular words of that, of that type. Um, in terms of flooding um, environment areas, ha have you had flood wardens and, and, and flood assessments there that you've been part of as it's your area um, that you are convinced with, with some of those plans going through or are we still lacking in some of those real delivery plans to protect the area? My experience to date is that the reaction to the, the flooding in that particular area is, is, is rather ad hoc. Um, Harpole doesn't have a, a flood ward and Kislingbury uh, does, um, but uh, that's that's provided by the parish council. Um, and it, the flooding is dealt with on an ad hoc basis as and when it uh, comes along, the particularly the issue around the Kislingbury, what's known locally as the Kislingbury roundabout, the roundabout on the A4500 adjoining uh, the bottom of Sandy Lane, uh, the, the flooding issues there are, uh, are severely problematic and that seems to have uh, become worse along the, uh, the, the row of properties known, uh, uh, on, known as South View, uh, which is right at the bottom of the Norwood Farm development. Uh, certainly in the last uh, two or three years, that's become noticeably worse and residents are, uh, are very, very anxious about that. Through Chair, I can absolutely imagine that situation because quite clearly we're building up the hill as opposed to down the hill. So this is clearly going to put additional pressure and concern to those residents as well. Thank you. Any more questions for Councillor Brown? Would appear not. Thank you, Adam. Oh, sorry. Right. It's not really a question, just to to support those comments. I think you know the the, the issue of the pepper potting of affordable housing. I think we're clear about that in our policies, and I don't know why we don't do it. Uh, uh, and I think it's just another example where we are being, um, I won't use your phrase, but we are we are effectively kowtowing too easily and too quickly on some of those issues, I think. Uh, I raised the, the point about the local flood authority, particularly for these reasons, because that concerns me greatly. And I think as we move forward into our new local plan, this issue is only get, going to get bigger and worse and potentially more challenging than, than we have it now. So I, I would want to make sure, I don't know how we make sure, I, I've had the assurances from the officer that um, nothing can progress effectively without that uh, being clarified. I just think we need to make that like writ large effectively. So thank you. Thank you. Again. Sorry, yes, again, Mr. Chairman. Um, just pick up on, on the principle of, pla of planning in terms of parking and in terms of access roads. Um, I'd just like maybe Chris Burton to pick that up in terms of that scenario that was drawn to attention about the widths. I think I've just confirmed with a colleague and I think there are issues here that need to be taken on board about the widths, dimensions of roads and the cars themselves. We know all cars have, have got larger. Um, and it's an interesting slide that a uh, good colleague, uh, Councillor Manners has here, um, which indicates quite clearly just how cars have got wider and therefore we haven't moved with the times um, it, and we are designing new areas and I appreciate we've got some very keen eager developers behind us here um, who always look at those principles but it really is important isn't it at the end of the day to ensure that we have plenty of space and uh, additional car parking etc and uh, those areas have to be borne in mind that we are looking about every car now is much wider than it was 20-30 years ago. Thank you. We'll seek assurance and the officer after the uh, question time thank you. Right, now I call forward um, Puni Ramirez and uh, Paul Carver to the front desk, please.
you have the requisite five minutes, and when they're a minute to go, I'll let you know as a warning. Thank you. Commence when you like. Just pull it towards you and press the button. That's it. Thank you, Chair. Dear councillors, thank you for the opportunity to address the planning committee for this application. The application presented before you forms part of the wider allocated West Northamptonshire Strategic Urban Extension, SUE, and is a reserve matters application for Phase 2B. Phase 2B lies centrally within the red line boundary approved under the hybrid permission for West Northamptonshire SUE. And to the north of Phase 1A, which was approved in March 2021 and which is currently being developed by BISRI. Phase 2B seeks permission for up to 120 homes, which 50% will be affordable housing. It includes amenity open space, a local equipped area of play, and a neighborhood park. The proposal has been designed to be in compliance with the approved design code, the phasing plan, and the regulating plan. Your officers have assessed the application and have recommended approval with conditions. We have proactively worked together to address areas of concern for the council and have reached the necessary agreement which have resulted in this recommendation for approval. Most notably, the applicant and the council have worked together in resolving the conflicting right of well design issues, which not only address the local highways issue, um, but in our view, have also resolved the matters raised in the objections from the British Horse Society. The applicant also notes that the Harpo Parish Council raised an objection to the application based on the type of play equipment to be provided in the local equipped area of play. As mentioned by your officers, this, de this detail has already been approved under a separate reserve matters application in March 2022. The proposal reflects what he has been approved. However, it reconfigures the play equipment and the path to allow for more open play space. Comments made by the council's housing officer regarding the level of affordable housing and its distribution in this place in this phase are noted. And the applicant welcomes the support received for this application, which will provide 50% affordable housing, which will be tenure blind and of high quality and in line with the section 106 approved for the hybrid application. Archaeology comments are noted and as demonstrated as part of the archaeological findings under phase 1A, B3 will continue to ensure that proper procedure is followed to preserve archaeological findings for the benefit of generations to come. Regarding surface water drainage, this phase of the development does not contain any significant drainage elements and has been designed in line with the overall strategy and details approved under the hybrid planning permission and reserve matters application, such as that approved in November 2021. With regard the, to this element, therefore, the applicant, like your officer, is of the view that the level of information provided to the LLFA is appropriate, proportionate, and adequate to address the requirements for this phase of the development. Conditions to deal with this can be also agreed. Phase 2B to be, to be of Norwood Farm will bring a number of benefits to the public in the way of high-quality housing in an area of high demand, affordable housing in line with the agreed levels, Open, play, uh, open and play spaces for everyone to use and has been designed to assure that the safeguard the land for Sandy Lane Relief Road remains free of development until this key piece of infrastructure can take place for the benefit of the local area. Overall, the scheme represents sustainable development which accords with national and local planning policy and as supported by the professional assessment of your own planning officer, we will kindly request this application is approved. Thank you. Members, we have questions for the agent. Yes, Councillor Heron, please. Given given the issue about flooding, have um, permeable surface, surfaces been considered um, on the driveways and, and no, so on to maximise the drainage? There's no need for that. The scheme has been designed for a one in 200 year storm event as per the current guidance from the Environment Agency. Um, the balancing ponds have been designed with that in mind. There's also the urban creep, 10% has been taken into account, which is where people hard pave their front gardens um, to get their additional car onto the drive. So there's there's no need for permeable paving. Everything is dealt with through the approved um, stormwater strategy. So so I'm I'm a bit baffled then why the local flood authority is saying they need more information and I've just heard you say that you've given them it and if, there isn't anything else if, to give. If you look generally when the, what the lead local flood authority come back with, they often ask for information. The assumption made is that they also refer to a lot of the information submitted previously and therefore if they only look at the information submitted in isolation for this particular application, 
then they won't have all the background facts. So, you're so saying... what, what we will do is that we can just replicate what information has already been submitted previously in order to fill okay. in any blanks. So your implication is our lead local flood authority have got it wrong? I'm yes. not saying your lead local flood authority have got it wrong. What I'm saying is they need to, needed to consider other information that would already have been within their um, remit okay. previously. So given that that is not the case or that it maybe is the case they have it you will resupply that information yes. oh yes yeah yeah there's okay. no issue there's, there's nothing there's no issue that oh, what are we going to do we, we will just provide okay. any information they require that will either have been provided before okay. or in a different form that's more in context with what they need okay um, maybe different planning routes or different diagrams different terminology just so they can understand it but it won't be anything materially new from what has already been provided it might just be in a different format okay but they may well be better informed than they are currently that's yes. the point yes. so yeah. okay thank you thank you any more questions from members thank you mr chairman um a couple of questions to the applicants if i may and welcome to um the planning committee the concern that i raised early on in terms of pepper potting of um, affordable homes into the uh, rural area as opposed to from an urban perspective. Uh, is that something that um, you would take on board? With the new Vistry model, where we would look to encourage greater partnership uh, partnership homes, um, the affordable housing that's provided is, is that which is specified within the 106. There is nothing to say that we won't be providing additional affordable housing in a different area through whatever partnership deal that we may do. So it's probably fairly safe to say that the amount of affordable housing will be increasing, but because it's tenure blind, you're not gonna go for, it, it just makes life a lot easier that you can, there'll be the units that can be transferred to an affordable provider in whatever guise, purely yeah. rent, shared ownership, et cetera. Because I see there obviously there are eighteen homes, eighteen affordable homes in this particular plan. Yes. Um, but quite clearly, we'd welcome more homes uh, that would be affordable and certainly create good communities, good strong communities. But they they would sit outside the the limit of the one or the requirements of the one hundred six. I I always say that those are the minimum requirements, but not the maximum requirements. Exactly. So obviously, we'd absolutely welcome uh, your your good selves to take that message back yeah, and, and see if you can you know we, we thank you for your heart in that matter. To increase them yeah, thank, thank you. you and in terms of that tenure blind perspective mr chairman uh, the point i raised about um, identification of car parking spaces um so that they really are tenure blind they generally don't have a space outside that has say a house number four and then a v next to it as a visitor space no, it, for it. It, it would it would have a number in to show where they're parking but would that also apply to a private dwelling yes the same thing yeah. as long as that does apply yeah, so no, it's, it's not that there's no way that you could sit there and say that's affordable, that's private. There is no distinguishing mark. Okay, thank you very much indeed. Any more questions of the speakers? Okay, thank you very much indeed. Turn to your place. Chris, do you want to come back on it? Particularly the disconcern of the difference between blocking and pepper potting. You did explain it to me why we did it that way, so do you want to? Um, Enlighten the committee, please. Sorry, just just to add, uh, he's very kindly just pointed out the section 106, um, which describes how the cluster should come forward. Um, it is in compliance with the section 106 in terms of clustering, so that there isn't a requirement for pepper potting within the section 106. Um, uh, the, the wording is shall be located in clusters of no more than 15 affordable housing dwellings with no more than 10 units of socially rented housing, affordable housing in any one cluster. Um, appreciating there's 18 at this location. Uh, strategic housing have obviously c come back and they're happy with the layout. And I would again say it's it's not sort of a courtyard of affordable housing. There's two clearly distinct parts. Uh, there's two separate roads. Um, so you, you don't enter a sort of a, a, an affordable housing. And I, I hate to use the word, but sort of a, a ghettoization of the affordable housing. You, you, you have two very distinct roads which have market housing and affordable on with, with a split at about uh, eight and, and 10. Uh, with regards to car parking, um, it is identical to the car parking to the west of the site where we have similar size units. So uh, there is the same number of spaces. Um, you, you, again, you, there is no difference, um, as the applicant pointed out, between the two types of car parking. Um, 
in terms of road width, it does meet uh, obviously highways design guide in, in terms of the width. There are visitor spaces provided, I think, um, across the site. So there are, there are visitor spaces available, but it also meets our parking standards um, in, in terms of the number of spaces. So, you know, a, a three bed house does have two spaces. I fully appreciate you may have three cars um, and th a lot of that will come under, I think the section uh, 38 agreement in terms of the adoption and the use of yellow lines and, and how that moves forward in, in terms of safety um, and and the road. But uh, I do understand members' concerns with car parking, but again, it, it meets our design code and it meets our, our parking standards. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. That's helpful to have that explanation. I think we need to look at our design codes and see when we can update those, because clearly at the end of the day, we, we know we have functional situations that quite clearly cause tension in communities, um, and they do need to be uh, upgraded. I didn't ask in terms of um, proper access for wheelie bins. Um, I'm sure that's been designed in, and also uh, cycle storage areas. So can I just have some assurance of uh, in terms of how those are um, logically planned because there's very little access sometimes between homes as we know uh, yeah again included in the design code so <clears throat> if the the property has a garage then cycle storage is within the garage um if not then i believe the cycle storage is to the um to the front of properties and there's secure cycle storage included um for the property so there's somewhere safe to, to place your bike um so yes and uh i think there's a condition with uh, i Sorry, I don't have the outline in front of me, but I'm pretty sure, 99.9% .9 sure there is a condition with regards to details required for um, uh, bin storage and recycling. So, so that you have the separate recycling from the bins as well to make sure there's space for it. Right. So, uh, sorry, Chair. Yeah, I, I, uh, I just thought I'd um, respond to um, Councillor Harris, um, obviously with your discussion regarding the flooding. I I so I do have some sympathy for the LLFA in that it's rather complex in in that you have an outline which has flood information, a reserve matters with flood information, a condition discharge with flood information, and this application with flood information. So I, I'm sure you got the point, but I think the point the applicant was trying to make is they think, and I I do agree with the applicant on this. The LLFA is maybe not pieced together all of it, but at the same time, I have absolute sympathy with them because it's awfully confusing trying to piece it all together. And as the applicant said, as part of the discharge of conditions, they can re-piece that information to make it clear what's applicable. I think part of the problem is the LLFA are, as we all are, very busy and they're receiving documents that's in the outline, which can include different phases. And it's, it's very difficult to find the right bit to draw together. So as the applicant kindly said, they can package up the information and provide any additional information as required. And I will, as I said to Councillor Persa, make sure I email them directly um, in terms of the wider flood risk and to make sure it's considered. Through you, Chair, if I may, thank you for that. I, I just think it's a really important area. We know we have this issue called climate change, which is going to impact more and more of these issues. Um, and, uh, of course, we I think we were without uh, officer representation in that area for a little while as well, so that wouldn't have helped matters. But um, I, I just think it's really important that we do what we can to help join up the dots for them, and we shouldn't just expect them to do that necessarily because I think they probably are quite resource light and they're getting quite a lot, as you say, thrown out of them. So anything we can do collectively with the developer, we should do. Councillor Addison, do you want to begin the debate or ask a question? Thank you. Um, do I? Sorry. Do you want to begin the debate? or you? I still... would like to, Chairman, begin the debate because I cannot stay much longer. <laughs> I have a meeting to go to uh, <laughs> and I should, I should be there in about three quarters of an hour. Okay. Could we start the debate? Right? We can start the debate, and I'd invite Thank you, you to much. start the debate. I have, three, well. I have three concerns about this application. It's in my ward. Um, and first concern is that, you know, West Northampton Council, joint core strategy, we have a policy um, of affordable housing, 35%. You know, really, I find it very sad that we're only going to have 15% on this piece of land. Um, Really and truly, are we going to stick to the 15%? Because yes. it seems to me that constantly we don't. We don't. We, we promise in the wind. So I have concerns about affordable housing. I have concerns, of course, about the parking. 
Um, 99% of people these days have a car and on-road parking is not a nice thing. So um, I think we need to think very, very hard about car parking and flooding, Chairman. Flooding is a very big issue in part of my ward. And the more concrete you build on that very uh, steep slope that you're, you're built, that is being built on, it's flooding Kislingbury in particular. We have had three major floods recently in Kislingbury. It just has to drop a bit of rain um, and the village is flooded. We do have a flood warden, thank goodness, and Kislingbury is in actual fact working on a plan um, to help alleviate the flooding. But it is an extremely, extremely important thing to Kislingbury. So frankly, don't like the concrete, don't like one of my villages flooding, not very happy about the affordable housing. I think we do need affordable housing and I think we should be very careful um, with our developers um, and car parking, please. Majority of us do own cars and we do like to keep our cars off road. Sorry, Chairman, my rant for the day. Thank you, Councillor. Who's going to go next on the debate? Or we got to the point where we debated it or what? We want to move to the vote. So, do we have a proposal? I'll propose that. Do we move to the vote, Mr. Chairman, and accept this planning application with the conditions attached? Do you second, Councillor Jones? Sorry, Councillor, I see you close hand up first. I apologise. All those in favour of the officer's recommendation, please show. That was unanimous, as I can see. Thank you, Roger Dean. We'll now move to item seven, which could be the fastest application I've ever seen. When there's no speakers, it's about a road. I don't anticipate it's going to last more than five minutes, Anne. Chris, are you ready? Right. So, item seven, London Norwood Farm again, a road. So, I'm ready. I have the wrong slide. My apologies. I'm hoping to win the award for fastest application through strategic committee. <laughs> Uh, this is an interesting one. Um, it's So this is the, the phasing plan, which I would have usually, if I put the whole thing on earlier, you would have seen phase 2B. The two green lines are what you are asked to approve today. They're for side roads. I've asked the applicant why. Um, it is two phases which have yet to be sold. Um, they think it helps future developers if they know roughly where the road is because they can then plan the number of units off the side road uh, work out the price they can pay for it, um, and then move forward. I sincerely doubt these side roads will ever be built. Um, it is it is to help with marketing exercise. Um, we do have an LLFA objection on the same grounds, uh, lack of information. Uh, the conditions, once again, tie them to uh, not commence until that's been signed off. Um, and uh, we have a... I suppose I politely call it a question mark from highways as to why they were looking at this. There is no section 38 in place. They would prefer that to have gone first. Ultimately, if they were to build these side roads, I assume we'd see um, an amendment application come in to, to alter it or, or a whole new application. So in, in brief, the application is there to assist the sale of future phases because it allows a design to be placed around a road that the local authority said could be there. It means that they can then work out the number of units they can place in there, including the affordable housing um, and the open space and bid accordingly on the phases. Uh, your officers recommend approval. Thank you, Chris. Anybody got any questions of Chris? Yes, Councillor Harris. Well, just an obvious one, which is it seems odd that developers seem to want to use a strategic planning committee to help in the sale of his properties that that's all but if that's i've heard you correctly it just seems a very odd thing to do to take up your time our time uh for a principle of selling property seems a bit odd 
I don't think we're in disagreement, Councillor. <laughs> it's it, it's within their gift to put the application in. It may well be that this road is the road that's built. It may be that this is in the final fix. Um, ultimately, uh, we, we tried not to take this to planning committee, uh, but the constitution as is uh, means, I'm afraid, your uh, Tuesday afternoon is taken up with it. Um, not notwithstanding just this but one one question that just came came to mind is is will the roads be adopted <laughs> if, if it were to be built yes um, so, they, so this, this is where highways so, so normally you sort of do this in tandem with a, the 38 procedure because you um that that's our adoption and uh le basic legal dealings with with highways um that looks at the road in in a different kind of detail um i suppose to the way planning does you know we we make sure it works in planning terms that procedure makes sure it works in actually taking vehicles on it in in terms of the structure of the road etc um it usually you, you you take both forward in tandem because sometimes you have to tweak one to make the other acceptable um you know I, i've dealt with a couple of nmas where and uh, non-material amendments where they've had to tweak the road um because the section 38 adoption process needed a slightly different camera on a corner etc so uh, yes and they would have to submit this uh there's, there's lots more work they'd have to do to get this road up to a an adoptable standard if they were to go forward more thank you mr chairman yeah, uh a question clearly why are we proposing this to be accepted without a section 38 in place and i actually i agree with you i don't think that road will ever be built like that uh, it's a convenient plan to, to deposit but why are we being used should this not fail uh of course of your robustness uh well nikki that it just doesn't get ticked the box because it doesn't have a section 38 next to it really to start with it, it, it doesn't have to follow that process it's well within their gift to to go forward this way they've paid their application fee um and and uh, and therefore it deserves determination there's no i always have no objection it, it's more a, a a question mark as to uh, i'd say i i i give you their commentary you know it's a well this is not how we normally take it forward but they're it, well within their gift to do it so um I, and ultimately, I, I would say, to put a slightly different spin on it, the local authority want to deliver houses here. So if we can assist in terms of the developer taking it forward, it, it helps us to continuously provide housing at this location. And we made money out of it. May I? I can't yes. resist one final comment, which is if, we, if that's the situation, we should be a little bit more insistent on our requirements for affordable housing. <laughs> Well, I, I I wonder if that question would arise, councillor. And my, my response would be, obviously, the more money the scheme makes, the more chance there's a clawback for more affordable housing by the Section 106. So if we can help assist in terms of getting the development to move forward, it, it, it should increase the scheme's viability and deliver more affordable housing. <laughs> so so we've had, we've had the debate and everything. Do we have a proposal? Do we accept this as a recommendation by the officer? Uh, sir, um, I, I propose that we actually accept the no, accept recommendation it, yeah. and accept. All right, whatever. So those in favour, please show. That is unanimous. That is passed. There's no further business, as I understand it. So I'll close the meeting at ooh, 4.42. Don't forget, there's still some cake over there if you want it. <laughs> Thank you for bringing it, Andre. <laughs>